Rahman uh, Rahim. Good morning to you all. Uh, we, we haven't taken too much time from your sleep, uh, and uh, it's an honor to be among you, especially uh, on such an occasion as, as this, when we are mentioning uh, the, um, the life of the Prophet Sallallahu What a beautiful uh, thing to gather us. What a beautiful discussion uh, to have. Uh, what a beautiful teaching to impart. Uh, what beautiful moments that we spend basking in his light, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. And uh, it's um, important, I think, uh, the topic that we chose for, for today uh, is very important for us because um, oftentimes when we think about the Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, we think about him in uh, his... Uh, Sayyidina uh, Imam Malik ibn Anas, uh, he would be greeted, uh, oftentimes people would come to his home and they would knock on his door and his um, servant would come out and ask, um, what do you want? And uh, uh, are, you, are you seeking masa'ib? Do you want um, rulings in fiqh? Or uh, are you seeking hadith? And they would tell her, we're seeking masa'ib, we're seeking rulings in fiqh. And so he would go out. To, uh, he would go out to them and just give them whatever they needed, uh, or he would go to the masjid and teach the the, the, the fiqh. But if they were seeking hadith, she would tell them then stay right there, meet him in the masjid, and she would go tell him that they're seeking hadith from him. And so he would make ghusl, uh, put on his best clothing, put on uh, his best uh, uh, perfume. Right, which is why I'm mentioning the story. Uh, Athan gave me his best perfume. Uh, and then go to the masjid and sit on a raised platform like this that he had erected himself in the masjid for the sole purpose of teaching the hadith of the Prophet And he would light incense in the masjid as well. Uh, 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 and everyone who was there would also be in a state of wudu, uh, if not ghusl, uh, to receive those hadith from him. Uh, so this was part of his honoring of the hadith of the Prophet And I was mentioning earlier that uh, oftentimes when we think about the Prophet it's in his public official capacity as the Imam, as the leader of an army, as the one who adjudicates, as the one who uh, resolves conflict. Uh, and we see him in this light. Uh, but um, that is not... Uh, usually, uh, where probably uh, well, let me take let me take a step back. And and in following them, in following them, in following this sunnah, uh, we try to fit ourselves into the. We try to see ourselves in those roles as well. Um, but if you look at the character of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we're talking about the Prophet's character, um, and you and you talk about our character today. There's a little bit of a dichotomy, and, and that is because we, um, when we think about character, we tend to uh, to think about it in terms of how we handle ourselves and how we uh, comport, how we uh, uh, behave in the public sphere, how we behave with one another in public. You know, you say this person has great character. Look at what he does. Look at what she does. And it's usually in the public sphere that we're thinking about character. Um, and this is very important for us to reflect upon, because it's very easy for me to have good character with you. It's very easy for me in the public where we are spending time together in the masjid or after an event or in a conference or something like that. It's very easy for me to display good character with people in public. Right? Uh, we're not going to challenge each other in public. We're not going to provoke one another in public. We're not going to argue with one another in public, right? And so oftentimes when we think about character, we think about it in the public realm. And that is not where we get the, the greatest percentage of reports about the Prophet's character. We don't get, we don't get it from the public. We don't get it from how he is in public. We get it from his family and how he is in private. If you look throughout the books of the Shema'il, 
the character, the, the sections on the character of the Prophet who is reporting to us that that content? It's Aisha, it's Anas, it's Zayd, it's Um Salama, it's uh, Al Hassan, Al Hussein. These are the people who are conveying to us the character of the Prophet over and over and over again, which is incredible that most of what we know about the Prophet's character, we are receiving it from those who spend the most time with him in his private space. Intimate time with him at home. And uh, this is very important for us because home is where character is cultivated. Home is where character is developed and it is where a person will make the greatest spiritual progress along his or her path toward Allah and his messenger. It starts at home. And one of the reasons that marriage is half of our religion is because of all of the problems that marriage will present to the married couple that they will never have to face with their best friend who they meet over lunch, right? Or with people in the, in the public, right? Uh, with, with, with their co-workers. You're never going to be challenged by your co-workers the way you were challenged by your children, or by your spouses, or by your parents, or by your siblings. So home is where character is, great, is cultivated to the greatest degree. So much so that that character will get you half of your, all of you want to accomplish in the deen, it will, get, it will get you halfway there. Character starts at home. Character is tested most at home. And what do we say of a man who in his private life leads by a shining example, so much so that most of what we know about his character comes from those who are sharing that private life? Because if you ask my brother, for example, about me, you may have a certain, and not to focus on me at all, but you may have a certain impression about me. We're constantly judging. We we're constantly judging. We're constantly evaluating and constantly placing value judgments on the people around us. You know, and it's very easy for me, uh, especially because I'm here behind the mic on this raised platform, uh, you know, there's a certain presumption about me, right, that you might have about me regarding me that, oh, he's this or oh, he's that. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, uh, veil me from you, you know, because I know who I am. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um, uh, never ask me or never question me about the impression, whatever positive impressions people have about me. So, but, but we are in this, right? This is how we, this is how we think about, about people, especially people who are in the role of the teachers. But if you ask my brother about me, or if you ask my father or my mother about me, if you ask my wife about me, because if you ask my brother, for example, and they were to tell you unabashedly everything they know about me, or what their impressions are about me, or having to deal with me on a daily basis, having to forbear my weight, having to bear my weight and forbear uh, all of my idiosyncrasies and all of the things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is veiling from you, if you had to actually write all of that stuff down, how reflective of my public persona would those private details actually be? And take it from me. It would be as though you were, you were, you were, you were finding out about a perfect stranger. Like, this guy is not this guy. <laughs> In any way, shape, or form. All the details that I have now have nothing to do with the guy on stage. And this is something that we ask Allah subhanahu wa for help with. Because it's very easy for us to put on a face in public. But in private, it's very, very difficult to, feel, to fool anybody at home. You can't fool anybody at home. And so what do we say of a man whose details of his private life outshine the details of his public life? Privately. Privately. He outshines himself publicly. And, it's, and one of the reasons for this is because private, what's private is most consistent over time. 
What's public is incidental and it's occasional. But what's private is consistent over time. And this is the meat, the real meat of character. Right? When we talk about the character of the Prophet, this is what this is what we're talking about. How he was in his person over years. Over years. Um, and so this gets us to, uh, you know, let's take a step back and look at just the definition of khuluk real quick. The, the, the word khuluk comes from the three letters khalaqa, right? Khalaqa. And khalaqa means he created. Right? So character and creation uh, have a linguistic um, connection, right? Character comes from the same word that we get to create. And that, that, that uh, reality of the word, that, that, that lexical connection, also um, has to do with the reality of the word, the, 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 the metaphysical reality of the word. That is to say that character is something that we are already created with. Certain character traits is some, is, are embedded in us, are inherent to us, uh, from the day that we are born. You find children who are predisposed to certain character traits, uh, and certain character traits come easier to them than others. You might have a child who is rambunctious, who is, uh, uh, you know, um, what, would, what would they say, uh, uh, lively, uh, and, um, you know, uh, spirited, that's the word I'm looking for. It's very spirited, right? Uh, which is uh, a euphemism for a spoiled brat. <laughs> right? There's a book that's out there, How to Raise a Spirited Child, right? Basically, how to raise your spoiled brat. <laughs> right? And the, certain things later on in life may come easier to, to a child like that. Like, like competition, they might excel, right? Ambition, right? A sense of accomplishment, a sense of independence, right? It might come easier to a child like that. Whereas a child who is more um, a calm, calm natured, uh, cool, right? Who doesn't hit other children. That child might later on have empathy as their emblem, right? They may be very, they, they, they may be very sensitive to the needs of the people around them, right? And this this comes easier to that child. And one of the meanings of khuluk is nasib, is is a portion is is sort of what what is divinely apportioned for us. And Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, "Leisa lahum min al-akhirati min khala." Right, that they will have no khalaq in the hereafter. What does that mean? They will have no khalaq in the hereafter. And the word khalaq comes from khuluk and khalaqa, right? They have no khalaq in the hereafter. They have no portion in the hereafter. Nothing is designated for them. Nothing is, is reserved for them in the hereafter to, to anticipate or expect. So this means that certain character traits are part of our nasim. They're part of our, what's been apportioned to us divine. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sort of apportioned. And the Prophet himself said, this is not just in the language, but the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa himself said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, inna Allah qassama akhlaqakum kama qassama arzaqakum. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has distributed among you your character traits as he has distributed among you your provision in the world. You know, everything that you are provided in the world. Character traits are distributed among you as well. But that's not to say that an empathetic child cannot learn competition, or an ambitious child cannot learn sensitivity. That's not to say that, because one, there is a predisposition, but also there is mujahadat al nafs, there's uh, fighting the, 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 the ego, right? There's struggling against the ego. There is um, that there is the acquisition of virtues. And the Prophet said, He said that knowledge, just as knowledge is gained through learning, nobody is going to learn through osmosis. Right? You're not going to just Turn the turn the 
uh, the, the CD on as you sleep at night and the next day you're a scholar. I wish it was that easy. I wish it was that easy. Right? So knowledge can only be acquired through exerted effort in the pursuit of it. And just as that is the case, then Hel, which is forbearance, is acquirable. It is, you can acquire Hel through forcing yourself to be Hanim, through pushing yourself to be Hanim, through, through uh, exerting yourself to acquire that virtue for yourself until it becomes easy for you. And, just, and, and patience is one in the same way. You know, if you're not a patient person, well, you can become a patient person by, by, by intentionally pursuing that, that attribute. And in all of our tribulations, to behave like the patient people, to, 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 to begin to imitate and embody what the, the patient people have. Right? They, they, they. And, and he said, well, just in general, any virtue or any character trait can be acquired by exerting yourself to the pursuit of that character trait until you become. So Imam Ghazali says that if you are, if a person is uh, miserly, then one of the ways to get over that miserliness is by committing yourself never to say no, just pledging to yourself that I will never say no, and then you begin to give, but you begin to give little bit here and little bit there, so there's still a degree of miserliness, right? But at least you've never turned anyone down until that becomes easy for you. And then to set a certain amount of money that you're going to give every time you're asked and whatever, whenever you're asked, whatever the situation, I'm going to give this much money. And you give that much money. And then to, serve, to, to actually, uh, once you're able, once that becomes easy for you, then to actually go out and search for people who are in need and not wait until they come and ask you. You see, so, so by degrees, one can acquire the virtue of generosity. Right? The virtue of generosity by degrees until it becomes easy for you and you become known as a generous person. Or be, you know, not, not, that you become, not, not that that's your intention. You don't want to be known as anything. You want to only be known to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But until you become a generous person in your essence. Right? And so this is one this is lexically what the word means, right? And if we look at um, the technical definition of khuluq, right? Uh, and you might not have you, you know, I thought we were talking about the Prophet at home. What is all this talk about character? Right? What is the point of talking about the Prophet at home? If not to refine our character by that discussion and to improve and enhance our private lives you know, through that discussion. And this whole this, the prophet at home is all about this nafs. The prophet at home is all about purification of the heart. And that that theme, the prophet at home, is another way of saying, "How am I at home? How am I at home?" Because it's very easy for us to lay our claims to piety in the, in the hearts of other people. It's very easy for us to lay our claim to piety in the hearts of other people. Okay, I, I, I feel religious because so-and-so perceives me to be. And a lot of what we do in the outward, and I'm not talking about anyone here, I'm just speaking in general terms about Muslims in general. Right? And I'm speaking about myself to some degree as well. That a lot of what we do has to do with seeking acceptance in the hearts of other people and love in the hearts of other people for the sake of ourselves. Right? And this is why it's, it's one of the worst things that a person can do is to seek, to seek praise for himself right? through which one can be proud of himself experience a certain type of elation because so-and-so thinks such and such about me or because so-and-so and that's why one of the most destructive things that we can do to ourselves these days is uh, is not to weed ourselves off of our addiction to, to anti-social media right that's one of the most destructive things because at the heart of that mechanism 
And I dare say that this has a degree of every, this has a, a portion to every single thing that we post, if we're not careful, is a deep-seated need that is a, a narcissistic need for attention, for acceptance, for, um, for uh, uh, um, admiration at something we've said, or something we've shared, or something we've posted, or whatever it is. But there is a deep-seated need for the admiration of others. And it's called a like. We're seeking love. <coughs> we're seeking, we're, there's a, there's a deep-seated need for that. But that need is all in the nuts. That need is all in the nuts. And, this, and they knew exactly, they knew this. This is diabolical. This is absolutely diabolical. Because they knew what they were creating every time. And they admit this now. Right? The founders of Facebook specifically admit this now. That with the introduction of that little red uh, notification at the top of your uh, browser. Notification, so and so liked your post, so and so shared your post. With that little red indicator, they knew that they were creating addictions in people. They were creating addictions, and they studied this. With psychologists, before they even put it out on the platform, they studied this. And they're admitting this now, that they knew that they were creating addictions by setting up those notifications the way they were, such that you couldn't pull yourself away from Facebook even if you tried. And you deactivate and come back, and you deactivate again and come back to that website because there is some, it's like a, a fix. I used to have that, right? I used to have that, and, I, and it's something that I'm missing now. And so, um, uh, that was a tangent. I didn't intend to go on. <laughs> How did I get there? How did I start? Technical definition of photo. Why don't we just go back? Let's not try to retrace it, but let's just go back then. Um, Okay, so the technical definition of khunuk. Oh, that this is all about tazkiyat and nafs, is what I was saying. This is all about purifying the heart, right? Purifying the heart. Um, and uh, so the technical definition then, you have, in a lot of our uh, studies, we have, you know, whatever we're studying, the subject of our studies, we're going to go through a, a linguistic definition and then a technical definition. And the technical definition is called istilah, right? It's a mustalah. It's the nomenclature. So when we want to know about influenza, for example, you can look up Webster's Dictionary and get a lexical definition for influenza. But if you want a technical definition, then you'll have to go to a medical encyclopedia to figure out, okay, what's the history of this thing? Who discovered it? In what laboratory? Are there different strands of it? How, how, what are the different symptoms of it? What are the different uh, cures of it? Uh, what are the side effects of the vaccines for it? That's, now you're getting into the technical definition. And we have, um, we have collections of technical definitions among the ulama. One of the greatest of them is called, uh, his name is Anjurjani, and uh, he wrote a book called the Mufradat. And in this book, he says about khuluq, he said, al khuluq ibaratun an hay'atin lil nafsi rasikhatin yasturu anha al-af'alu bisuhulatin he says that khuluq, and you can write this in your notes, well, the women can write this in their notes, and guys are, men don't take notes. I'm a man, I don't take notes. Well, we have a couple of people taking notes. Not bad, not bad. Okay, so um, it's khuluq uh, is an expression. It's an expression uh, concerning a, uh, an, a, a, a deep-seated predisposition of the nafs. A deep-seated predisposition of the nafs. From which actions emerge with ease and facility. 
without the need for forethought or premeditation. Yeah, or consideration. You can say. But it is a it is an, it is a term, right? It's not ibara. It's a term concerning, or it's a term that uh, connotes the um, a deep seated predisposition in the nafs. From which actions emerge with ease and facility, without any need for forethought or consideration. Okay. Yeah. It is a term. It's a term uh, connoting a deep-seated predisposition of the nuts or in the nuts, from which actions emerge with ease and facility, without any need for forethought, without any need of forethought or consideration. Okay. So I'm going to give you an example. Uh, you're on the 101, right? 101's close. It's close by, right? Uh, it's far away. Five eighty, you know the five eighty, right? You come off the the exit, and there's a guy there with a sign, right? We'll work for food. And there's nothing but the the, the the light's green, right? The light's green, and the first thought that comes across your mind is, I need to catch the light. And you see the guy there, and the second thought that comes across your mind is, I hope that light doesn't turn yellow. Because there's no one in front of you in that light. Right? It's just you and the light that's in front of you. You're 100, 200 feet back, right? And you say, I hope that light doesn't turn yellow. Why? So the light turns yellow. And you go all the way to the front, right? Trying to pass the guy a little bit, right? So that now he's a little bit behind you. He's not in front of you. And then he comes over to you. And you're acting like you're uh, listening to the radio or you're on the phone or something like that. And then he rolls, then he knocks on the window, you roll down the window uh, as though caught by surprise. This is not autobiographical, by the way. I'm just making this up. It's a hypothetical, right? You're caught by surprise, as though you were caught by surprise. Yeah? And so he asks for money. And so you, you begin to think, you begin to look through your purse or your wallet, and uh, you begin to question, okay, how much should I give him? Should I give him $5, should I give him $10? And then it just hits you. It just hits you. Just give. The Prophet said, I sent him a gay. The Prophet said, I sent him a gay. So give. Because you're really receiving. You're really receiving. You're not giving. He's the one who's giving. And the Prophet's wives, when they used to give, they used to give like this. They never gave like this. They used to give like this. They used to give like this. So they were really, in essence, receiving. And the one who is taking, right, is actually the one giving. Who has the upper hand now? Is the one who's, huh? who's in essence, giving. Because everything that goes from them, they find in general. And they find in this world. And the fact that they're able to give this is proof that they find in this world because they gave before. And Allah SWT gave them again so that they would be able to give again. So you have all of this and you remember, oh, that's what Sheikh so and so, or that's what Sheikh so and so said, right? I should give. And so you pull out a hundred dollar bill. And you fold it, put it in his, and, and usually you give two or three dollars. Usually you'll give a five. Now, the most you've ever given is ten. But you pull out a hundred dollar bill, fold it, put it in his, in his hand. You don't even ask him to pray for you. Because you want, you want your reward with Allah subhanahu wa And you've got your hijab on, you know he knows you're Muslim. If, if you don't have anything identifying you, you know, you'll, you'll say something like, As-salamu alaykum. Right? Just so just so he knows you're Muslim. So you even gave a little bit of subliminal da'wah, right? 
Can you be said to be a person at that point of good character? How many people say yes? How many people say no? What, you have bad character? <laughs> How many people say yes? Good character. How many people say no? All right, why do you say yes? It's obvious, right? It doesn't need an answer. Why do you say no? Because it doesn't match the definition. Huh? It doesn't match the definition. Yeah, what's the definition? With ease and facility without any forethought. Exactly. Right? Good character is a predisposition in the nuts from which actions emerge with ease and facility without any need for forethought or consideration. So we're not going to say you have bad character, right? but you also are on your way toward good character. Because the more you do that, the easier it becomes, so that you don't even have to think about it anymore. You get to a certain point, you don't even have to think about it anymore. Now you have said to have good character, right? You see what I'm saying? So this is what is consistent over time. And what scenario for the human being is going to create an like, a, like an incubator, where good character can be developed over time. What is that incubator? Is it this room? Is it this room? Is this, where, is this the room where good character is cultivated? No. no. Uh, is, it, is it the masjid? Is it school? Is it work? Is it... Is it in, in the malls, is it in a, where, where is good character cultivated? Only at home. It can only be cultivated at home. And then how we are in the public sphere should be a reflection of what we are at home. And if it's not, then we've got a lot of work to do. Because that, that, that is living in a web of contradiction. If we are outside, different from how we are at home, if it's easy for me to call a friend, but difficult for me to call my mother or father, if it's easy for me to, uh, to, um, to engage someone with a smile who is sort of provoking me in the public, but difficult for me to, to afford that same smile for my spouse or my, or my siblings at home when they provoke me, then I've got some work to do. I've got some work to do. And I have to reprioritize the whole thing. I've got to prioritize. Right? So, so, so that your family then becomes your key to felicity, to spiritual progress. Your family become your key to spiritual progress. That my spiritual growth and my uh, intimacy with my Lord and my proximity to my Prophet, that is only through my wife, it is only through my husband, it is only through my mother or father, it is only through my children. That's where, that's where it's going to come from. That's where it's going to come from. So as you're listening to, all, to, to, to the Purification of the Heart series on the CD, or reading this book or that book, and thinking, well, I've got to put this all into it. Into, into, uh, in, into practice. I've got to start acting on these things. We have to make the shift, the mental shift, from the public space where you intend to act upon these things into your private home life. Because if you get it straight at home, in the public, it's not even an issue. It's not even an it's issue. It's already easy in public. The difficult thing is to be, to have good character at home where it counts. And one of the greatest proofs of the messengerhood of the Prophet and the prophethood of the Prophet is that from the very beginning of his life until the very end of his life, 
those nearest to him, those nearest to him, never had a single complaint about him. Those nearest to him, ever since he was young, ever since he was a baby, until the time that Allah SWT took him back, they never had a single complaint about the Prophet SAW. Never anything that they could point to, that they could say, this aspect of his personality, or that aspect of his, of, of, of his or, or this demeanor, or that, you know, they, there was never an instant you point out to me one in all of the, the, the hundreds of thousands of hadith that we have from him, Sallallahu in all of the books of Sirah, you point out to me one incident, one incident where the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi argued with anyone at home, where he ever fell into, into a single argument with anyone at home. We already know he never argued with anyone in public. He never argued with anyone in public. But at home, a single incident where the Prophet ﷺ ever argued with anyone at home. <coughs> and this was before his advent as well. For 40 years, before his advent as well. And in all those years he was married to Khadija, Anha. 15 years of a marriage with Khadija, we don't have a single incident where they actually argued about anything. That was his predisposition. He was non confrontational, and he was empathetic beyond words, and he was able to forbear all of the weight of the people around him. And it's as though he had a bird's eye view of everything that ever happened. He was able to see it from a different space, a different, from a different vista altogether. He was able to, to perceive it as it was. And you cannot get there, you cannot get there, unless you have the disposition of acceptance of other people as they are. not to place expectations on one another, not to place, uh, and not to base our frustrations when they fall short of fulfilling our rights over them, but to concern ourselves with the fulfillment of their rights over us. That's, what, that's how he was, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And to be in service of one's own self, so, the, so the, the, the day that I got married, the, the night before I got married, I called Sheikh Hamza asking him for advice. But no, this was a, this was, no, I had called him to, to, uh, I, 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 to invite him to my wedding. And I said, I know you're very busy, so please, you know, uh, I'm expecting that you, you, you cannot come, so there's no false expectations here, but I would love if you would be able to make it. So he said, I can't make it, but I have one piece of advice for you. I said, that's, exact, that's all I need, that's all I need, just give me one piece of advice. He said, in all my years of marriage, in all my experience with married people, he said, I can give you just this one golden, valuable advice, that if you take it, and if you act by it, you will have felicity in, in every, every day of your marriage. He said, have zero expectations. Was his advice. Have zero expectation. Right. And basically purify your heart. <laughs> purify your nerves. Because the nafs is what expects, right? The nafs is what you I I expect this from you, I expect that from you, I deserve this, I'm worthy of that, I'm entitled to this, that I, 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 I. At the heart of every expectation is a nafs. So the Prophet accepted, he didn't expect, he didn't have expectation, but he accepted his family as they were. And they were, they, they were able to breathe in his presence. They were able to, to be 
in his presence, to just be themselves in his presence. So much so that on a few occasions they crossed the lines with him. On many an occasion, we're going to get to that, inshallah, we're going to talk about that. They crossed the lines with the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he accepted them. He accepted them. So I think this is a, a, an important um, uh, important for us to, to, to discuss this before getting into the real meat of, of the material, the content of the material, uh, because this is not an intellectual, um, you know, this is this, this the content that we have to share today is not for the intellect. It's not for the intellect. It's for transformation. You know, and and I'm looking at faces uh, the most virtuous of, of what North, Northern California has to offer. I know you per I know many of you personally. You know, so a lot of this is just by way of encouragement and reminder to continue doing what you do, right? Because I know you all to be people of very good character. But there's always room for improvement. There's always something that we can do. Uh, there's always a heightened sense of awareness. And it's just by way of reminder, uh, especially to myself, uh, that uh, I am uh, accountable for what, uh, for what we share today. No. I'm zero now. So any questions before we go? Uh, anything that I didn't touch upon that perhaps uh, needs uh, needs mention? Okay. There we go. So when are we going to uh, stop Ahsan for this first session? 11.30. 11.30? Okay. We might push it out a little bit. Okay. So I think the, the first thing that I want to discuss, uh, what I have planned, inshallah, is to speak about the Prophet Sallallahu at home before we just jump into the anecdotes of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi life at home. We want to talk about him as husband and him as uh, father and as grandfather, right? So in the roles as husband, father, and grandfather. And uh, um, in order to do this properly, uh, we need to know who are the who who was there present in the Prophet's household, sallallahu Who were these people that he was uh, engaging on a daily basis, right? And so what I'd like to do is introduce uh, the Umahat first, and then talk about anecdotes from the Prophet's life with them, and then the mothers of the faithful, and then introduce his children as well, uh, and then talk about anecdotes that he had, uh, the you know, situations uh, that, that aro uh, arose with his children as well. So um, we'll talk about, we'll talk about, we'll proceed there and inshallah uh, finish uh, this session after speaking about the wives of the Prophet so, the Prophet um, had 11 wives all throughout his life, 11 wives, beginning with Khadija. Uh, and she was the first of the wives of the Prophet uh, Obviously, we know, and I'm going to spend more time on the wives that we don't really hear about mostly, right? Uh, Khadija and Aisha, I'm going to just speak about them very, very shortly. But, um, but the, the, the other wives I want to highlight a little bit more. So get this in your notes, right? I don't know if you have a collection of all the wives in the Prophet Sallallahu in your own personal notes somewhere, but this would be a good opportunity to, to write something down about each one of them. Um, six of them, all of them were from Mecca, right? He didn't marry anyone from Medina. They were all his wives from Mecca. Uh, six of them uh, were uh, from Quraysh, and four of them were not from Quraysh, and one of them was from Bani Israel. Okay. Uh, so the six who were from Quraysh is Khadija bint Khuaylid, Aisha bint Abi Bakr, Hafsa bint Umar ibn al Khattab, Umm Habiba bint Abi Sufyan, Umm Habiba bint Abi Sufyan. Umm Habiba, the daughter of whom? Abu Sufyan. And that was a marriage that happened, we're going to get to it, that was a marriage that happened before Abu Sufyan uh, became Muslim. Right? Okay. 
Um Sarma bint Um Abi Umayya and Sauda bint Zuma. These were the six from Quraysh. And then four uh, from who were not from Quraysh, Zainab bint Jahsh, Maimuna bint Al-Harith, Zainab bint Khuzayma, and Juwayriya bint Al-Harith. And then one from Bani Israel, Safiya bint Hanyi. Okay, so these were the wives of the Prophet Sallallahu And he had two concubines, Maria al qutsiya and Rayhana. Right? These were his two concubines. So, about Khadija, anha, just a couple things about her uh, that, that I think are very important um, is that Khadija, the Prophet married a woman who was twice married before that. And she had children from both marriages. She, she had children from both marriages. It's interesting, one of her, one of her sons was named Hind, and one of her daughters was also named Hind. Right? So she had a boy and a girl with the same name as Hind. Right? Uh, Khadija married the Prophet uh, She was older than him, obviously, by 15 years. This is what we know. Uh, uh, you know uh, she was not only one of the richest uh, women of uh, Mecca, she was one of the richest people of Mecca. Yeah? And uh, the Prophet lived a life with her raising her children with her. So he married into a family already that was already set, and he didn't have any children with him. Um, uh, uh, no, he had all of his children, I'm sorry, he had all of his children with her, except for Ibrahim. Ibrahim was the, daughter, the son of Maria and uh, Kutiya. Right? And there is a little bit of a difference of opinion regarding Maria, whether she was the wife of the Prophet or not. The majority of the scholars believe that she was uh, um Walad, that she was a, uh, his concubine, and she had become Um Walad. And we're going to talk about that when we get to her, inshallah. Uh, but she was the only one who bore him a child other than Khadija. So the Prophet already came into a marriage where there were children, and he brought into that marriage Ali. So, so he came to that marriage with Ali. Right? So Khadija raised. Imam Ali uh, and so you know what? What do you say about Imam Ali alayhi salam? What do you say about him, who's who's who was raised by the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu the perfect man, and raised by Sayyidah Khadija bint Khuwaylid the perfect woman, whose wife was Fatima Zahra, whose sons were a Hassan and Hussein. What do you say? about Sayyidina Ali in, in, in that, in the midst of that, the, of that. No? So he was raised by Khadija. Sayyidina Ali Islam was raised by Khadija. And so um, the, the marriage that they had was such that Sayyidina Khadija gave the Prophet all the space he needed to be happy in his, to, to be happy. And he did the same thing for her. Right? He did the same thing for her. He did not, after the marriage, uh, seek to supervise her or micromanage her in any way. The most that he would do is send one of the servants uh, to, if, if Khadija was taking too long to get back home, to send one of the servants to just check on her and make sure she's okay. Right? And uh, Khadija herself tried to get the Prophet to have more money and to, to, she tried to make him a partner in the business and he refused. Uh, so they had a very synergistic relationship. And one of the things that we can glean from that marriage is that the greatest thing that they could have given their children, the greatest thing that the Prophet could have given the children of, of Khadija, and the greatest thing that Khadija could have given the children of the Prophet whom she had with him, was a happy spouse. That's the greatest gift that you can give to your children, is a happy wife or a happy husband. You can do no greater good to your children than entering happiness into the hearts of your spouses. And we get that, we get that from Khadija. 
She was the comfort of the Prophet She was the, she was like the mother of the Prophet She was like the mother of the Prophet She fulfilled that role for him, and her age helped her in that. That she was she was older than him, right? So that she, so and Abu Talib fulfilled the role of father. So when he lost Abu Talib and Khadija, it's as though he lost his parents all over again. So Khadija was his everything. She was his rock. And so much so that Aisha, who was very jealous by nature, right? She said, I I I was a very jealous woman, but I my jealousy was was not for any woman more than it was for Khadija, whom I never met. Whom I never met. And on one occasion she tells the Prophet, he constantly mentioned her. And he's not just constantly mentioning her to Aisha. She's just the only person complaining. But he's constantly mentioning her to all of his wives and to all of his friends. And he's constantly mentioning her uh, and he's constantly seeking out the company of her old friends. Tell me this about Khadija. Tell me that about Khadija. All those, all those years that I met, she was, she was 40 years old before I met her. So she, I've got 40 years of memories about her that I don't have access to. So you tell me. Tell me about Khadija growing up with us. And he would go and spend time with them. And they would say, Khadija is this, and Khadija is that, and Khadija is this, and Khadija is that. After every meal, he would tell the, the wives of the Prophet if there was anything left over, distribute this to, 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 to the neighbors. Don't forget our Jewish neighbor, and don't forget the... the, the, the the, uh, the, the friends of Khadija. So this was how he honored her. He missed her dearly. He missed her dearly. And, she, and though she was one of the richest women of all of, uh, the, the richest people of all of Mecca, she died with a, without a thing to her name. Without a dinar or a dirham to her name, she died. We talk about Abu Bakr, the one who gave everything to the Prophet several, several times. <coughs> Khadija did no less. Khadija did no less than that. And she raised his children. So this was Khadija. I, I didn't want to speak too much about her, and we, we cannot speak enough about her. But she was... Uh, uh, and then after the death of Khadija, after the passing of Khadija, the Prophet has a dream. And in that... No, no, I'm sorry. Uh, the, the, after the passing of Khadija, um, the Sahaba, and especially the women among the Sahaba, they see that the Prophet is without a, a, a caretaker in the home who will help him raise all of his daughters. He's got six girls with Khadija, six girls. Right? Uh, what, what are their names? I'm sorry, uh, four girls, and he's got two boys. Sorry. I'm sorry, hold on. We go through the names and, I, and we have the number. I, I can't, I can't. Uh, he had seven children. He had seven children. Say, uh, seven, right? Six. Six. Huh? Six, six. six with Sayyidah Khidija, seven with uh, Maria. No, okay, so I uh, uh, got stumped up there. So he had Ruqayya. He had who? Who else? Zayna. Um Kulsum. Fatima, those were the four, the four were girls, right? And then he had Abdullah, he had Al Qasim, he had Abdullah, and he had Ibrahim, seven, right? So they saw that the Prophet had six children at home, and Imam Ali, and the children of Khadija, right? How many children in that house? He's got ten kids in the house. And so they have. They have to say, he's got to get married. He's got to have some help at home. And so they suggest, they, they suggest to the Prophet Sauda. And the Prophet accepts. He says, then go and ask Sauda. And if she agrees, then, then, that will, the, then that will be fine. So the first person that he marries after the death of Khadija is Sauda. And Sauda um, is uh, the daughter of Zumad ibn Qais, ibn Abd ibn uh, Shams al Qurashiya. Uh, she was married to a man who was uh, called Sakran ibn Amr. Um, and she had become Muslim along with her husband. And they both migrated to uh, Abyssinia in the second migration to Abyssinia. There were two migrations to Abyssinia. 
the first is when they, they got there and they stayed there for a while, and then there was a rumor after the boycott had ended, there was a rumor that the Quraysh had ended the boycott and accepted Islam. So they all came back, right? And then when they found that that was not the case, a few of them went back to Abyssinia, and a few new people went to Abyssinia, right? She was among those new people who went to Abyssinia on that second, on that second migration. And so um, after, the, after that uh, uh, migration, her, her, um, her uh, husband uh, died. And so, um, one of the things that we find about her, uh, one of the things early on in the marriage that we find about her is that after the battle of Badr, she saw uh, one of the, uh, she, she saw some of the people taken as prisoners of war. And she had, you know, this, this sight sort of took her by surprise. She was taken aback by that sight. How the leaders of Quraysh and, and other tribes in Mecca are now They've, they've, got their, their, they've got their hands chained to their necks, right? And so, that, so she, she said something that the Prophet and I heard where she, she expressed um, uh, you know, her dismay at, at, how, at that <coughs> spectacle. And the Prophet and I heard this, and uh, he, um, he reminded her, you know, he said, that these are people who fought Allah and His Messenger, and she turned. She, she, this was, this was, you know, she, she sort of came to her wits about, it, and her wits were restored. And she said, "Ya Rasulullah, I, I, uh, I, I apologize for that. It was just, it was just the, the, the shock of seeing it." Uh, now, so this was one, one of the things, one of the encounters that we have. We don't have very many encounters with uh, Salda. One of the reasons for this is because she gifted her day to Aisha. Right? And she said, Ya Rasulullah, I just want to have, I don't have any desire for uh, intimacy, and it's enough for me if, uh, if you keep me as your, as your, uh, your wife, and I remain in, in, uh, in that status. I just want nisbah, I want that relationship to you, uh, to be one of the, the faithful, uh, the mothers of the faithful, and the Prophet accepted that. Um, one of the things that um, she says uh, on one occasion that uh, she, she made the Prophet ﷺ laugh on one occasion in which he led her in salah and he uh, had such a long prostration that she uh, grabbed her nose, right? Uh, and, uh, and after the prayer was over, she turned, she, the Prophet ﷺ turns to her and she said, Ya Rasulullah, I grabbed my nose because I, I thought that my nose was going to bleed from how long that prostration was. And so the Prophet ﷺ laughed at that. Um, no, and she was one of the two women, her along with Zainab, she remained in her house uh, and did not uh, perform Hajj after she had performed uh, the Hajj with the Prophet ﷺ. She did not leave the house to perform Hajj again. And uh, they all went on Hajj again, and she refused to go on Hajj again because, uh, uh, because her Hajj with the Prophet ﷺ could not be replaced by another Hajj. Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha says about her, مَا رَأَيْتُ مْرَأَةً أَحَبَّ إِلَيَّ أَنْ أَكُونَ فِي مِسْلَاخِهَا مِنْ سَوْدَى بِنْتِ زُمَعَةً مِنْ مَرَأَةً فِيهَا رَحِدَّةً She said that I had not seen any woman who, whose <coughs> footsteps I would have liked to tread in terms of her personality and in terms of her, um, her demeanor than Sauda. Sauda was known to be uh, among all of the wives of the Prophet ﷺ, she was known to be the most, um, uh, the quickest to please the Prophet ﷺ in following his command and in uh, uh, avoiding his prohibition. That whatever the Prophet ﷺ said, Salda was the first person to implement it without any questions, without any uh, feedback, uh, without any back and forth, as you, as you command, Ya Rasulullah, as you command. And this was something that Aisha felt envy towards Sauda for. I wish I was like that. Right? But that was not Aisha's constitution. Right? She was going to, there was going to be a little bit of back and forth between Aisha and the Prophet But Sauda, there was no back and forth on, on, on anything. No. 
And she lived with the Prophet ﷺ for about five years, three of them in Mecca, and she died in, uh, in the second year after the Hijrah. And she relates from the Prophet ﷺ five hadith, one of which we, we just shared. And then Aisha, anha, the Prophet ﷺ saw in a dream that he was going to, uh, that, that Jibreel ﷺ brought to him uh, a, uh, uh, a, uh, a gift that was wrapped in white silk. And so he removed the gift, the, 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 the silk, and beheld Aisha. And this was a recurring dream that came to the Prophet ﷺ three times uh, that's related in uh, Bukhari. And so he, when he would come uh, out of that dream, he said, if this is from Allah, then it must certainly come to pass. And after the third day, he uh, sent word to Abu Bakr radiallahu uh, He sent a servant to Abu Bakr to ask for the hand of Aisha. And Abu Bakr radiallahu responded saying, uh, can a man marry his niece? But this, was a, this was not something he could conceive. Right? This was not something that he could, that, uh, he, he just never conceived that, that a man could marry his own niece. So he sends this servant back to the Prophet and he says, well, Abu Bakr says that, you know, is it even possible, is it even legitimate that you could marry your own niece? And so Abu, the Prophet said, Abu Bakr is my brother in faith. He is my brother, but he is my brother in faith. Does that need any explanation? A little bit of explanation? Yes, yes okay. <laughs> this is a reaction that I'm getting from you guys. A couple of you guys got it, but most of you are thinking, wait a minute. So the Abu Bakr al his reaction is that how could the Prophet marry his own niece? Meaning that how could the Prophet marry the daughter of his own brother? Who is the brother? Abu Bakr, he sees himself as the brother of the Prophet that you and I are brothers. How can you marry my daughter if we are brothers? And so the Prophet said to him, he sent word back saying, you are my brother, but my brother in faith. We're not, we're not more than that. Right? We're not, there's no biological connection to us. Preventing us. Right? So Abu Bakr never thought in his, never, never in his wildest dreams did he think that Aisha could ever be married to the Prophet ﷺ because he's her mahram, right? being that uh, Aisha is his niece. So uh, the Prophet ﷺ married Aisha, and there's so much that we can share about Aisha, uh, but, um, but in the interest of time, I'm not going to speak very, uh, very long about her. Um, there is a there is a story where the wives of the Prophet I'll just share one story about Aisha. Um, the wives of the Prophet according to Aisha, um, Aisha radiallahu says, Inna nisa Rasulullah She says that the wives of the Prophet we were two uh, cliques, right? We were two cliques. And all of the wives of the Prophet lived in the quarters that now, if you're in Medina, you know where the Prophet is buried. There's, a, there's an enclosure, right? There's an enclosure where the Prophet is buried that no one has access to that enclosure. It's like a, a square enclosure, right? All of the houses of the Prophet were there, were there. All of the wives of the Prophet lived in that enclosure, in their own separate quarters. And each one of those, those quarters had a, a, a door leading to the masjid, right? So they all lived right there in, those, in that enclosure, right? So she said that we, were, we divided ourselves into two cliques. Basically, naturally, organically, I have to say organically, I'm in Northern California, so organically, uh, they fell into two different cliques, right? Um, she said, 
عائشة وحفصة وسودة وصفية. So عائشة حفصة سودة صفية. They got along well. They got along well. Right? They, they was all right with them. وحزب آخر أم سلمة and the rest of the, the, the prophet's wife. Right? So basically, Aisha, Hafsa, Sauda, and Safiya. Basically, Aisha chose the women who were not really a challenge for Aisha. <laughs> right? So the, those are the women she got along with. Right? And then she says, Um Salma, and the rest of the wives. Right? So Um Salma, she would give deference to her, and she said, and the rest of the wives, right? Who, 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 whose names uh, shall go without mention. Uh, so on one occasion, the, the Muslims knew. So what the Prophet ﷺ would do, he had nine wives that he that, that were that were, that all that were alive all at the same time. Uh, one of his wives died just two three months after he married her, uh, Zainab. And so uh, nine wives that he would split his time among these wives, and he would go. A, a full day and night with one wife, and then the next day and night he would be with another wife, and the next day and night he would be with another wife, and so on and so forth. Right? He would spend his time equally with his wife. So the Muslims knew uh, who was the most beloved to the Prophet. On one occasion, Amr ibn, uh, uh, Amr ibn As asked the Prophet, Who is the most beloved person to you? Thinking he was the most beloved person. And he says, Abu Bakr. No, he, say, he says, uh, uh, Aisha. He says, Aisha. He just said, so it's known, right? And he said, no, 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 I don't mean Aisha. No one, has, no one can compete against Aisha. I, uh, that's known, right? I mean, among the men. He says, Abu Ha, right? He says, her father. And he said, then who? Then, then. And he gives him a long list. And he says, as long, as long as I was going to keep asking, he was going to keep answering. And so I got to a point where I just had to stop asking, hoping that I wasn't at the bottom of the list. Right? And so Aisha was known. And so the, the, the companions loved to give the Prophet a gift. So they would wait until he was in the house of Aisha in order to send the gifts to the Prophet when he would be in the embrace of his most beloved wife, Aisha. Right? And so, <laughs> this obviously is going to create massive tension, right? Massive tension. The, every time, that, and then Aisha, of course, is going to, sh what, what happens is that when, when the gifts come, and the gifts usually come in different forms, right? Sometimes it comes as food. And if it comes as food, then what? The Prophet is going to distribute that food among his wives. Right? He's going to, it's not just going to be consumed by him and Aisha. Right? He's going to distribute it to his wives, to his family. He's got, there's, there's something like 30 kids in the house. And I actually need to, do you know how many children? No? But I, one of the things that I intend to do, inshallah, is count all of the children of all the, the, the wives. Um, so, uh, the, the, so, so if you are one, you know, just imagine receiving a gift knowing that this is the night that the Prophet is with Aisha, and you're receiving a gift on that night, and it happens again the next week, the, 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 the nine days later. It happens again nine days after that. It happens again. It happens again. So every, every night that the Prophet is with Aisha, you're getting gifts. And it's Aisha's night. So, why doesn't he ever get gifts when he's with me? Right? That we can distribute to Aisha. And to the to the rest of them, so this creates tension in the, in the, in the household of the Prophet and Aisha is loving it. Aisha is just loving it, right? And so it, it, you know, her reputation is now she knows her status in the heart of the Prophet because that status now is known to all the guides. Every, everyone, in, the, 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 all the companions know. That this is how that, this, that she is the beloved wife of the Prophet. So <laughs> and so uh, they get together and they speak to Umm Salama, the leader of the other clique. They speak to Umm Salama and they say, Umm Salama, ask the Prophet Salama that when he kind of, that, 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 that he should tell the, 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 the companions that if they want to send gifts, that 
they should just send gifts. And they shouldn't postpone, like whenever they think to send a gift, send it on that day that you think to send the gift. And wherever the Prophet is, the gift will, will be received. It's not like Aisha's house is, is the warehouse for, for where gifts are stored, right? Just where, wherever the Prophet may be, send your gift, right? And let's put an end to this thing. So Umm Salma talks to the Prophet about this. And he doesn't respond. And so she goes back and, and, she, and she, she says, well, you didn't say anything. And they say, okay, the next time he comes to you, then bring it up again. And so she waits for how many days? Nine days. And she mentions it again to the Prophet And no response. And the Prophet knows what's going on. He knows that it's jealousy from Aisha. And then she goes back and he says, he didn't say anything. So she, they say, again, just, just don't, let him, don't let him go without a response. Solicit a response from him. Just be, you know, be, be resilient, right? And solicit a response from him. So she waits another nine days. And so the Prophet tells her, Right? Don't harm me regarding Aisha. Do not harm me regarding Aisha. And so uh, Umm Salma immediately says, Ya Rasulullah, I would never harm you. Hasha, Hasha, that I would ever bring harm to your heart. Right? And she retracts. And she goes back to the wives and she says that this is what was said. Don't harm me regarding Aisha. So they said to, they said to her, and you just let it go? <laughs> And so they, so 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 they, they went then to Fatima. <coughs> they spoke to Fatima about it. So they, they they say, okay, he won't reject Fatima, right? He won't he won't he won't say anything to Fatima. Oh no no no, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah yeah, to Fatima. And so Fatima goes to the messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and she doesn't say what they said before, which is. Whenever you receive a gift, because it's not about the gifts. Whenever you receive the gift, let it be on any day, right? Have your companions send the gift. Uh, whenever they think to send the gift, she goes right to the heart of the matter, right? And she said, "Your wives have asked me, right? Your wives have asked me to uh, plead on their behalf regarding the daughter of Abu Bakr." <laughs> so, so she, she's not, you know, and, and, the, and the Prophet ﷺ says to her, Ya Fatima, do you love what I love? And she says, yes. He said, then love this one. Right? Then love Aisha. And so she goes back to the wives, and she says that this is exactly what she said. And, and, and they said, you, you were not a faithful representative of us. <laughs> you did not represent us faithfully at all. Go back to him and tell him that it's about the gifts, right? Go back to him and tell him that, the, the, you know. And so she said, well, my, I would never go back to him to speak about her. Right? So she refused. And so what do they do? Yeah, they sent Zainab bin Tajash. Right? They, sent, they sent Zainab bin Tajash. And Zainab bin Tajash goes to the Prophet <coughs> on the night that she is that he is with Aisha. He, she goes right to the Prophet <coughs> on that night. Aisha is right there, and Zainab bin Tajash begins to talk about this, trying to solve this and say, you know, this is just unacceptable. And she said, so she said to, to the Prophet, <coughs> she basically said, no, so let me not put words in her mouth. She said, Ya Rasulullah, inna azwajika arsannani ilayka yas'alnaka al-adla fi binti Abu Fahanta. So she said, O Messenger of Allah, your wives have sent me. Right? <laughs> Excluding herself from the whole situation. Like, I'm, I'm, just, I'm, not, I'm just a messenger here. Your wives have sent me, asking you regarding the daughter of Abu Fahanta. What did Fatima say? That, that your wives are complaining to me about the daughter of what? Of whom? Of Abu Bakr. So they, they so Zainab says, your, your, your wives are asking me regarding, to, to come to you regarding the daughter of Abu Quhafa. Who's Abu Quhafa? 
He is the the grandfather of Aisha, right? The father of Abu Bakr. So the name Abu Bakr cannot be mentioned. Because if you mention the name of Abu Bakr, you know the Prophet is not going to side with you. He's going to side with Abu Bakr, right? So they mentioned the name of Abu Quhafa, the daughter of Abu Quhafa. <laughs> and so she begins then to talk about Aisha. She says, she did this, and she does that, and she does this, and she does that. And then she's just railing on Aisha. And Aisha is just waiting for her moment. And she's looking at the Prophet Sallallahu trying to see if there's any indication that the Prophet Sallallahu will allow her to respond. Until it became too much. Right? It became too much. And then she knew from the Prophet's silence that she had permission to respond. And she responded. And she let her have it. She answered every single thing that was said, and she just unleashed on Zainab bin Tijaf regarding the other w women and regarding Zainab herself. Right? Because Zainab is actually now, it's not the other women who are sending Zainab. Zainab also has a stake in this. And so the Prophet ﷺ, after Aisha is done, the Prophet ﷺ turns to Zainab and he says, Inna hadnatu Abu Bakr. She's the daughter of Abu Bakr. <laughs> And that's where that hadith, that, that's where that hadith, so, so it's done. At that point, it's done. There's no, there's no, um, there's no turning back now. There's, there's no other attempt after that. Right? She's the daughter of Abu Bakr. You called her the daughter of Abu Muhammad, but she's actually the daughter of Abu Bakr. Right? So well, my hands are tied. My hands are tied. She's the daughter of Abu Bakr. Uh, this, we, we have to look at this uh, a little bit and say that uh, I said I wouldn't talk in a very long about Aisha, but this is an example of an anecdote in their lives. Um, the, uh, the request of the wives was uh, understandable, right? You know, the, the, the scenario, the way it played itself out, anyone would be, um, you know, uh, any one of those wives would naturally be justified in this type of frustration. But the request of the wives was utterly absurd. It was absurd. Just imagine the Prophet ﷺ going to the member after Jummah. You know, you make your, uh, you have your Jummah announcements, <laughs> right? And the Prophet ﷺ announces to all of these men who are sitting there, saying, "If any of you, just imagine this, if he was going to follow what his, uh, his wife." If, if any of you have a gift that they want to send me, let them send me that gift on any day of the week. And don't wait until I'm in the house of Aisha to do so. Just imagine if he would have done that. <laughs> How ridiculous that would have been. It was absolutely ridiculous. The Prophet would never put himself in such a situation whatsoever. One, the companions who had no intention of giving him any gift would now feel the the, the, uh, the obligation that, oh my God, I never even thought to give him a gift. Or, oh my God, I don't even have the means to give him a gift. Or, what am I going to do? Now I, now I need to start you know, shopping for gifts. And the gifts would have just come to the Prophet from all quarters every single day. The, the, the houses of the Prophet would just be storehouses for gifts. Right? Every one of the houses of the Prophet would just have. And there's not room. There's no room in any of these, these quarters. The, the, the quarters are very, very tiny. right? So where, what is he going to do with all of these gifts? And who is going to actually uh, invite his companions to gift him on this day or that day? Right? No one's going to do that. So this is just one of the, 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 one of the social dynamics of Medina that the wives just had to accept. Like this, this is just how it is. Right? It's just how it is. Right? And they just had to accept that. Uh, and so Aisha, she enjoyed this uh, special status with the Prophet She said that the Prophet died with his head between my neck and my, uh, and my chest. Um, and in, in, in this discussion that he's having with the, with the wives, uh, he says to her that, he says, he, he says to Fatima, and he, he says to Umm Salama, he says that the revelation doesn't come to me while I'm in the sheets of any of my wives except for Aisha. While, while we're covered by the blanket 
I'm under the blanket of any one of my wives except for Aisha. That's where revelation comes to me. Right? So, so don't, don't harm me concerning Aisha. And the next wife of the Prophet of Allah, Ali was never. is uh, Hafsa bin Umar. Hafsa, the daughter of Umar ibn Khattab. Uh, the story with Hafsa is that <coughs> Sayyidina Uthman, when, uh, uh, no, uh, I'm sorry, that uh, uh, Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu, uh, Umar approached Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu and um, offered Hafsa to, the, to, to Abu Bakr. And Abu Bakr um, just fell silent. He didn't say anything. And uh, so Omar left him. Right? But he left him with something in his heart against Abu Bakr. And that, that hurt Omar. That, 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 that he didn't respond. And of course, didn't, his refusal to even respond is, a, is, you know, is a, an indication to Omar that he does not want to marry and so he goes to Uthman then, and this is after the death of, um, of uh, Uthman's first wife, right? Uh, Sayyidi, did, did he marry Umm Kuthum first or Ruqayya first? Ruqayya. He married Ruqayya first. So Ruqayya had uh, just died, uh, and Omar uh, uh, who goes to Uthman, and he offers Hafsa to Uthman. And Uthman says, Omar, give me a few days to think about it. And, uh, and he gets back to Omar saying, I'm not really thinking about marrying these days. You know? He was very, he was still mourning uh, uh, the, the death of Ruqayya. So Omar Adran, who goes to the Prophet and he says, Ajab and the Uthman. Like, I, I'm just uh, in shock at Uthman. That he's not, he's not even, uh, he's refused Hafsa. And he mentions Abu Bakr, right? That he's not, I mean, they're refusing my, to marry my daughter. And so the Prophet says to Omar, he says, Allah will marry Hafsa to someone better than Uthman, and he will marry to Uthman someone better than Hafsa. Right? And so for, ha for Uthman, he will marry, her to, marry him to Umm Kuthum, right? to his, daughter, his second daughter. And so Uthman becomes Dunurain, the possessor of two lights from the Prophet ﷺ, the possessor of two lights. And, and after uh, Umm Kulthum dies, uh, the Prophet ﷺ tells Uthman, if I had another daughter, I would marry her to you, Uthman. Uh, and so uh, Umar ad who then receives the news that the Prophet ﷺ, he tells her, I, and who is the one who's better than Uthman? He says, you're looking at it. Right? And he asks Umar for the hand of Hafsa. And Omar al who is elated beyond belief. He couldn't imagine that. And so he, the next time he sees Abu Bakr, Abu Bakr tells him, he comes to him and he says, Ya Omar, he says, uh, right? Maybe you harbor something in your heart against me. And so Omar says, yes, yes I do. <laughs> and so he said, uh, he said, uh, don't, uh, he says, forgive me, brother, because I heard that the Prophet was considering Hafsa. And I didn't, and if the Prophet was going to do so, then I would definitely not have, uh, I, I, I didn't, oh, and he said that I didn't want to reveal the secret of the Messenger of I didn't want to reveal the secret of the Messenger of Basically, that if the Prophet would have changed his mind, right, that that would have been a very difficult thing for Omar to. to so he wanted to preserve the secret of the Prophet and allow him the, uh, the leeway to decide whether he was actually going to marry Hafsa or not. And so he said, had the Prophet changed his mind, I would have surely accepted your offer to marry Hafsa. Right? And so Omar Barada Sadrahu, the other right? So his, uh, he found comfort in his heart, and everything went back to normal between him. And, uh, so this was Hafsa. And so he told Hafsa, Omar told Hafsa, he warned her, he said, and he knew that his, his, of his love for Aisha, 
And he told her, uh, whatever you do in this marriage, do not follow the footsteps of Aisha. Right? Don't try to imitate Aisha. Right? The, 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 the feistiness, the, 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 the back and forth, the, 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 the arguing that Aisha would have with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. There was argue, there were points that Aisha uh, angered the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi several times. Right? And so much so that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told Aisha, he said, I know when you're pleased with me and when you're displeased with me. Right? When you're pleased with me, you say, Wa Rabbi Muhammad. And when you're displeased with me, you say, Wa Rabbi Ibrahim. You know, when you're pleased with me, you swear by the Lord of Muhammad. I swear by the Lord of Muhammad, such and such. But when you're displeased with me, I know it because you don't even mention my name. You say, Wa Rabbi Ibrahim. I swear by the Lord of Ibrahim, alayhi salam. Right? And so she said, Ya Rasulullah, la, uh, la he said, she said, Oh, Messenger of Allah, I don't, I don't avoid anything except your name. It's just your name that I, that I turn away from. Right? Right? It's just, uh, I don't turn away from you at all. It's just your name that I turn away from mentioning. Right? In those moments, it's just your name. So it doesn't go past my lips. Right? My heart is with you all the time. My heart is open to you all the time. It's just your name. So, Omar tells Hafsa, don't be like Aisha. And then another occasion he tells her, don't be like the one who is, who is, uh, who is, who is in, in her own self-admiration of her own beauty. Right? Don't follow the footsteps of the one who is, uh, who is, who admires her own beauty. Right? But he told her basically that, it, you know, maintain uh, composure with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. On one occasion, uh, Safiya, um, she, uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam confides, no, not uh, Hafsa, Hafsa, sorry, Hafsa confide, uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam confides in Hafsa a secret, and he tells her, do not reveal this secret to anybody. And so, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam hears this secret, then, from one of his other wives. And he, um, divorces Hafsa. He divorces Hafsa as a result of that. When the news reaches Omar Radhanhu, Omar Radhanhu begins to throw dust upon his, his head. And he says, what will, what will I say regarding myself and Hafsa on the Day of Judgment? What will I, how will I answer my Lord regarding myself and my daughter on the Day of Judgment? And Jibreel Aysan him comes to the Prophet commanding him to take Hafsa back, telling him that she is your wife in Jannah. Right? So take her back because she is your wife in Jannah. In another narration, take her back to comfort the heart of her father. Right? And so he takes her back. I had said I had mentioned something about Sauda uh, that I wanted to clarify. So Sauda did not live. Uh, three years in Mecca with the Prophet and, and two years in Medina, and then died. No, that, that's not the case. Uh, but she, but those five years, she was with the Prophet where uh, her, um, where she, she was, she lived with the Prophet for those five years. When Farida means that, uh, which means that uh, these were the five years that she spent with the Prophet where uh, where her night was shared with the with uh, with Aisha, and then she gave that night to to Aisha after that, after those five years. Do I say anything like that? How would you say it? Uh, how would you how would you mention it? Hmm? Because you brought this to my attention. How would you say it? I don't think it was clear. No, how, how would you say it? Please, please. Because I know after the lesson you're going to tell me I would have said my lesson. <laughs> so please, please correct me. Uh, just making sure that she didn't pass away. Yeah, alhamdulillah. Where did she pass away? She passed away after, after the death of the Prophet Well, because I had a similar, I don't have a similar, similar confusion. Because you said that Hajj was done and she never went back for Hajj. Yes, yes, yes. So yeah, I was so a bit this confused is, by that. So I said, I said that, uh, that she had passed away after those five years. That, that was a mistake. Right. That was a mistake. Um, so th th those five years she lived with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But she shared the night with him and then she basically gave the night away. 
Exactly. She shared the night with him, and then basically she gave that night away to uh, Anisha. And so for those five years. Okay? Is that clear? It's still not clear. Muhammad Billahi Ali. Clarify what we're, what we're saying here. Huh? Billahi Ali. Yeah, this is Amana. This is Amana. Hmm? Okay. okay. So I misspoke. I misspoke. Um, and then we have Um, uh, um Al-Mu'mineen, Zainab bint Khuzayma, uh, is the next uh, of the wives of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And she was known even in the days of Jahiliyyah as Um Al-Masakeen. She was the mother of the destitute, the mother of the, the poor, Um Al-Masakeen. Uh, she would give uh, so much of, uh, of what she owned. Yes. What was the name of the wife's son? Zainab bint Khuzayma. Zainab bint Khuzayma. And she, uh, she was married to uh, Abdullah ibn Jahsh, uh, who was uh, slain at Uhud, and who was buried where uh, Sayyidina Hamza was buried. They were buried together in the grave. Uh, so Zainab bint Khuzayma was known as Umm al-Masakin. She had children that she brought into this marriage, and the Prophet raised her children, and she only lived with the Prophet for two or three months, and then she passed. So the marriage lasted two or three months. The commitment of that marriage outlasted the marriage by many, many years, right? Which was the children that she brought into that marriage were now the children of the Prophet ﷺ, who he raised and who he would, he would, he would uh, spend and, uh, upon and, and provide for until they all became of age. No. <clears throat> And so uh, Umm al-Mu'mineen then, he married after that uh, Umm Salama bint Abi Umayya. And Umm Salama also uh, had uh, a, a, a previous marriage. All of his wives had previous marriages except for Aisha. And she brought into this marriage four children. Right? So she brought four children with her into this marriage as well. Uh, Salama, Umar, Durra, and Zainab. These were her four children. Um, um Salama, her story is very difficult. Um, she uh, traveled to Habasha, right? Uh, and uh, when she came back from Habasha to Mecca, um, her husband had the idea that uh, we should go to Medina, right? At that time it was Yathrib. And this was before the Pledge of Aqaba. So this was the first household that actually left Mecca to Medina uh, for, for the to make hijrah to Medina, before the hijrah. They made hijrah before the hijrah. They made hijrah before the pledge of Aqaba itself. And so Um Salama prepared to go with her husband, Abu Salama, uh, to, uh, on this journey. And then when the, the tribes of Abu Salama and Um Salama got wind of this, uh, basically they, they fell into dispute over the matter and it's because they were persecuting him. And, and, uh, and they, uh, and the, the tribe of Um Salama refused to allow her to accompany Abu Salama on this journey, right? So, so they split them, right, and say, Abu Salama, you go, and we are keeping Um Salama. And then the tribe of Abu Salama refused to allow Salama, right, the, 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 the son, to stay with his mother. Right? And so they took the, the, the child, and Abu Salama had to leave by himself and go, um, uh, go on his own. Uh, Amana, I, I beg you, if any detail of what I'm sharing today is, uh, is different from what you've heard or from what you know, or if I slip, if I slip of the tongue or something like that, you must correct me because this is a trust. We are discussing the details of the life of the Prophet Sallallahu People are writing this in their notes. And we have people here who are far more knowledgeable than I am uh, about these matters. So if there's anything that I have said uh, that needs correction or clarification, please do clarify or correct. Raise your hand and, or, or just interrupt me and clarify, please. <clears throat> uh, and so for an entire year, Um Salama would, would go to a certain place in Mecca and she would weep over being separated from her child and her husband uh, for an entire year. Uh, this was a very difficult situation, and this was uh, this was before the Pledge of Aqaba. This is in the 
heat of the, 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 the persecution um, of, the, of the Muslims. And so um, the, uh, they finally got to a point where uh, they, they said, enough is enough. You know, this woman is grieving continuously. And we have to solve the situation, and uh, uh, so so they seek to resolve it. They ask for the, the permission of the tribe of Um Salama to relinquish her to her husband, to, to return uh, the, the the son to her, and uh, this is finally uh, approved. And so she sets out on her own to make this journey all the way to Medina on her own by herself, uh, until Osman ibn Talha sees her. And he says, where are you heading? And she says, I'm going to Medina to be with my husband. And he says, alone? She says, there's no one who's going to escort me. No one's. And so he said, no, I will take you. And he was not Muslim. Uh, and he uh, esc escorted her all the way. And she said, I swear by Allah that, that, that I, I never saw more. Uh, no, of course, uh, the Prophet ﷺ being the exception. But she said, I never saw a more virtuous man than Osman ibn Talha. That uh, every time that I was to mount or dismount, the, uh, he would bring my camel down or raise it up, but he would leave. He would go far away and turn his back so that uh, I could mount and dismount without um, having to worry about him uh, seeing me. Uh, and he, uh, he was a wonderful companion to her on, the, on that journey, uh, providing for all of her needs. And uh, he becomes Muslim later on. But, uh, but during this journey, uh, he is, uh, which is, a, it's an interesting dynamic, right? The being a Kafir in that, in that time and helping someone migrate to the Prophet after persecuting them and having all of this on your mind throughout the entire journey of bringing Um Salama to her, to her husband and thinking about all of this, you know, this is, it's, it's just a very interesting dynamic for Uthman ibn Talha to play this role, right? Um, but being that uh, they couldn't just leave her to, to go on her own, and none of her own tribesmen would, were doing this, uh, then, then, uh, then he stepped forward. No. And of course, we all know about the role that she played on, uh, in Hudaybiyah uh, in the uh, in getting all of the, the Muslims to comply with the command of the Prophet We can't speak too much about her. Uh, Umm al-Mu'mineen Zainab bin Tijash is the next wife. Um, oh, uh, one thing about Umm Salama, she was the last of the wives of the Prophet to die. Right? She, was one of the, she was the last one to die. Um, and, uh, uh, and that was in the year um, 59. And some say in the year of 63, and there's a little bit of discrepancy there. Um uh, al-Mu'mineen Zainab bin Tijash. Zainab bin Tijash uh, was, <coughs> uh, was married to the Prophet and she was one of the, the noblest of the Quraysh. And the Prophet married her to Zayd, right? To Zayd uh, ibn Harith. Uh, this was at the insistence of the Prophet. Uh, Zainab did not want this marriage, but the verse was already resonating in her mind that when Allah SWT and his messenger decide an affair, it is not for any of the believers to have an opinion of their own after that. And so she accepted uh, Zayd ibn Harith, she married him, uh, but she was known to be a woman who was rather sharp um, uh, and, and, and not very easy uh, in the marriage. Uh, Zayd tried over and over again to to continue that marriage, to keep that marriage uh, together, uh, but it got to a point where uh, it was unbearable. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Zayd complained to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told Zayd to keep the marriage, to keep her, right? And Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala revealed a verse uh, on that occasion, uh, but, uh, but that, that marriage dissolved. Uh, Zayd divorced her, and then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam married, uh, married her. And she was extremely uh, devout. Um, she was uh, known. Uh, she she took pride in this um, because she would tell the wives of the Prophet Sallallahu that all of you were married, with the exception of Aisha, I think. But she said all of you were married by your family. But the Lord of the Throne above seven heavens, He is the one who married me to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam.
uh, about her, it's also known that uh, this uh, that on the wedding night, on the wedding night, uh, the the companions after the wanima they stayed and they overstayed their welcome, and the, the, the Prophet ﷺ wanted to leave, wanted them to leave. Uh, but uh, none of them left, uh, and so he gave the signal that he basically got up and left himself and went to spend a little bit of time with uh, some of his other wives, and then he came back, and at that point they got the hint that, okay, maybe it's time to go. Uh, and so uh, this was the occasion of a, of a verse being revealed that, uh, that when you're in the presence of the Prophet in his home, then don't overstay your welcome. That this caused the Prophet a harm, but he was shy to mention it to you. But Allah is not shy of ever mentioning what is true, right? So Allah SWT brought out, brought that out, and this was in the Prophet's character. Since we're talking about his character and his character, especially at home, uh, when it came to his own rights or his own preferences or his own uh, what, what what would be convenient for him or preferable for him. The Prophet ﷺ was the last person to speak on his own behalf. And he, he just accommodated the scenario of however that the scenario played itself out, he accommodated for it. He found a place in his heart to accept it to, as the decree of Allah and to make the best of the situation. But so, so as long as it concerned his own rights, he was not going to speak about that. But once it concerned the rights of others, because these companions now who overstayed their welcome at the Prophet's house, what they would do was they would do they, they would they would do this with Abu Bakr and they would do this with other of the companions. They would stay and over and and, and, and they stay longer than what was uh, what was acceptable. And at that point, the Prophet ﷺ would go to them and say, "This is not acceptable. Don't stay too long after uh, being." Uh, receiving the generosity or the hospitality of people, don't stay too long. And it's when it concerned the other companion. When he saw that this was now becoming a habit, now, now that we can't spend this time with the Prophet Sallallahu we'll go to some of the other major companions of, the, of Medina. And so this was what he had no tolerance for. If it came to the rights of others or it came to the preferences of others, he made sure that they learned those adab, those etiquettes. Right? But with himself, it was very easy for them to overstep their welcome with him uh, because this is, and this is very important, especially in the presence of people who, who um, are so magnanimous and so generous. It's very easy to have, to, to lose composure with them and, 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 to, uh, and to take certain things for granted, to take certain liberties around them. Uh, and it's something that we have to be on guard for. Especially when we're dealing with people who are very close to Allah SWT, whose aspect is more jamali than jalali. When they're, when, when they're, when they're, you know, what's dominant in them is their uh, magnanimity as opposed to their majesty. Right? That, uh, that it's, with, with a person who is, um, who is a little bit intimidating, it's very easy to, to have a certain decorum with them. But a person who is smiling all the time, who is jesting all the time, a person who is, uh, receives you well, who is warm, who is affectionate, compassionate, and these are the, the traits that sort of dominate in that person, it's very easy to take things for granted with that person and to lose that decorum. Right? And so this is one of the things that we learn uh, in Allah's rushing to the Prophet's defense here in revealing a verse about that. And so he comes back to Zainab and he's with her. Uh, and Aisha, she, she uh, describes Zainab. And this is important because Aisha is jealous of these wives. But she is also the one from whom uh, we receive the most praise of these wives. So she's praising these wives that she, is she feels that jealousy for. And so she says, that she was the one who used to come to, to, to my aid in the prophets in the household of her, the governing of the, the affairs of the household of the Prophet. And I have never seen a, a woman ever who was more uh, uh, who was better in terms of her um, devoutness and in terms of her fear of Allah 
uh, than Zainab. And in terms of wa astaka hadith and wa awsal al rahimi wa a'lam as sadaqatan or more truthful in speech or more uh, loyal in, in terms of her uh, familial ties uh, or greater in terms of her um, uh, charity. Wa ashad ibtidana min nafsiha fin amali alladhi tasdaqu bi uh, or more uh, serious in terms of putting herself to the task that she had before herself. Uh, um, but she was seeking certain certain proximity towards Allah through uh, through that work. So if there was something that she was uh, a task that she was devoting herself to, that she never saw someone more serious in that task, uh, because that task was going to bring her closer to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala than Zainab. Uh, and she was known as Ma'wal Masakin. She was known as the shelter of um, of the, the, the poor. Uh, on one occasion, they asked the Prophet ﷺ, who is the first person who will um, who will uh, uh, meet you in Jannah among all of the wives? Right? It's a beautiful question to ask. Right? Who is the first person who will be with you in Jannah among us? Right? They wanted to know, basically. Um, after his passing, uh, who among them would be the first person to be reunited with him such, such that her happiness could be restored to her the soonest? And he said to her, uh, they, she said, He said, the, the longest of you in terms of your hands, right? the one who has the longest hands. And so after he said that, they got a reed out, a palm reed. And they started measuring the hands of all of them, right? They, they got and they all gathered together and started measuring the hands. And it turned out that Sauda had the longest hand, right? Her hand was the longest. So Sauda uh, lived thinking that she was going to be the first person to die after the Messenger Sallallahu and she would be reunited with him. And all of them thought that, okay, Sauda has that distinction. Right? They, all, they all relished in the distinctions that they had, right? Uh, Aisha relished in that distinction that I am the only one that has, I, I am the one who, uh, you know, the, 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 the last thing that reached the Prophet's stomach, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, was my saliva, she said. That's the last thing, and that's after she had uh, moistened the, the toothbrush of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That's the last thing that reached the Prophet's stomach was my saliva, she said, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, radiallahu ta'ala anha. So, so Sauda lived all of her life, life thinking that she would be the one to die uh, after, uh, right after the Prophet ﷺ. But that was not the case, because when uh, Zainab died, and she died in the year 20, and she was the first person to die after the Prophet ﷺ among his wives, they knew that, okay, Atwalukunna Yadan did not mean the one who had the longest hand, it, uh, literally, but it meant the one who was the most generous. So they had to find out what was the interpretation of that. And they said, okay, the only interpretation of that was the one who was the most generous among us, and that was Zainab. No. No. <clears throat> and then after that, the Prophet married yeah. Juwayri. He married Zainab, he married Juwayriya bint al Harith. And she was uh, one of the daughters uh, of uh, Abid Dirar uh, in uh, Bani Mustalaq. And Abi Dirar had, um, there was a battle with Bani Mustalaq. There was a battle of Bani Mustalaq. Abi Dirar um, was the father of Maimuna, of Juwaliya, sorry, of Juwaliya. And he was the one who sought to wage war against the Prophet ﷺ, to wage a battle. And the Prophet ﷺ, when he heard about this, he preemptively sent the Sahaba to Bani Mustalaq, and they, uh, they, um, they, reigned victorious in that battle. And so what happened was uh, many of the men and the women were taken uh, as prisoners of war. And one of the women was Juwaliya bin Tinhad. And she had, um, she had fallen as a prisoner of war to one of the companions. And so that she, she herself uh, tried to seek uh, manumission for herself. right? And she went to the Prophet Sallallahu seeking that, seeking aid as, uh, as she sought her own freedom. She didn't want to be with that companion. 
and so uh, she wanted her freedom. And this is interesting because her father led this war against the Prophet ﷺ. Her father was the one who wanted to to wage this war against the Prophet ﷺ. And she's coming to none other than the Messenger himself, seeking his help in getting her freedom from one of his companions. <coughs> the minute she comes to the Prophet ﷺ, Aisha observes her and she says, I hated her from the minute that I saw her. Because she had this pleasantness about her. She had this beauty and she had this beautiful pleasantness about her that I knew the Prophet would have seen just like I had seen. I knew the Prophet perceived it the way I perceived it. And the Prophet said to her, Is it would it would it not be more pleasing to you that I should marry you? And she said, yes, that would be much more pleasing to me than just to have my freedom back, is to be your wife. And so the Prophet ﷺ proposed to her, and uh, Aisha, who hated her at first sight, she said that she, she has this love-hate relationship with all of these wives, right? The, there's not hate relationship, right? that's just, a, uh, I shouldn't have said that. But she has this initial hatred, right, this initial karaha. For, for the situation, not for the woman herself, but just like, it, really, really? You, you just come to the Prophet mm -hmm. and presenting yourself. And the, the, there are many women that came to the Prophet presenting themselves as wives. And Aisha is, at, is in a state of dismay. She said, really? I, what, drive, what would drive a woman to just gift herself to the Messenger of Allah like this? Right? And so none of the women who proposed to the Prophet in that way actually the, uh, were accepted. The Prophet didn't accept the marriage of any woman who actually proposed like that. Uh, and he would actually, uh, he would fall silent. And, and then someone, one of the other companions would volunteer and the Prophet would say, yes, if you were willing, I can marry you to him. And, and the woman would say, yes, as you please, Ya Rasulullah, as you please. So this happened several times. Um, this is, this is all, this could come up in the Q&A session, I guess, but they thought of marriage very, very differently from how we thought, think of marriage today. Because right? my she has got to be my soulmate, she's got to be my soulmate. They don't have, it's, it's, it's easy, it's easy with them, right? To marry, to divorce, to remarry, to, it's very easy for them. Uh, you know, the, like Dr. Omar says, the past is a, is a foreign country. They do things a little bit differently. Uh, so this is um, so. So uh, what happens with Juwaliya is that the Prophet marries her, and Aisha praises her, saying that I don't know of anyone who was a greater blessing to the to, to, to her people than uh, Juwaliya, because the day that she married the Prophet all the companions freed her relatives, and they would say Asharu Rasulillah, Asharu Rasulillah. The in-laws of the Prophet the in-laws of the Prophet. How are we going to have as prisoners of war the in-laws of the Prophet So on that day, more than a hundred households had their men returned to them on the day that he married Juwaliya. So on a, in a lot of ways, the marriages of the Prophet are, are to unite tribes. And there, there, there's many wisdoms behind it. And we're not going to get into all of this because it, it's going to take us off of topic. But they're to unite tribes. They are to soften hearts toward accepting. And Bani Musalak, after that, they, people become Muslim. People become Muslim because now he's part of the family. Right? So people convert. People who were, who were battle-hungry, trying to fight against the Prophet and now end up converting through marriage. Right? Through this, this relationship. Now that they have to the Prophet and Juwaliya was known as being a person who had, who was so devout, and she would make dhikr constantly, tasbih constantly. On one occasion, it's related that the Prophet he wakes up and he finds her sitting uh, in her dhikr, right? And uh, Fajr uh, is upon is upon them. Uh, and she remains in that in that uh, in that uh, position uh, before Fajr. Throughout Salat al Fajr, the Prophet comes back to her, and duha is close, and he sees her in that position, and he says he says, "You haven't moved from this."
from this place since this morning. Like, you didn't go to sleep and then wake up. You didn't pray for that. And then so she said, yeah, so I've been, I've been here now. So this is her dhikr. This is her dhikr with Allah Subhanahu like, This is her time that she's spending with Allah Subhanahu Wa right? In awe of her Lord. Constantly making dhikr with Allah. And so the Prophet Sallallahu said to her, <coughs> he said, um, لَقَدْ قُلْتُ بَعْدَ أَرْبَعَ كَلِمَاتٍ ثَلَاثَ مَرَّاتٍ لَوْ وُزِنَتْ بِمَا قُلْتِ مُنْذُ الْيَوْمَ لَوَزَنَتْهُنَّ سُبْحَانَ اللَّهِ وَبِحَمْدِهِ عَلَى ذَا خَلْقِهِ وَرِضَى نَفْسِهِ وَزِنَتْ عَرْشِهِ وَمِدَادِ كَلِمَاتِهِ right? So you've heard this dua before, right? So the Prophet ﷺ makes, he, t he t teaches her these four words. He says that had you said these four words, they would have outweighed, right? They would have outweighed all of the dhikr that you have done, right? And this, th these four words are Subhanallah wa bihamdi. Let's all say it. Subhanallah wa bihamdi. Adad al khalqi wa rida nafsi wa zinat al ashi wa mijada kalimati. Subhanallah and uh, so glory be to Allah subhanahu wa taala and praise be to Allah subhanahu wa taala in accordance with the number of everything that he has ever created and that he shall ever create. And in accordance with the extent to which he is content with himself. And in accordance with the weight of his throne. And in accordance with the full extent of every one of his words which are infinite, his speech. So had you said that dua, it, it would have outweighed all of that time that you spent in dhikr. And one should understand from this that the Prophet <coughs> is seeking to comfort her. And he is seeking to uh, make things easy on her. Like what one of us today would, would say, well, you know, good job, right, and, and continue, and, and, if, and if a person uh, isn't able to keep, keep that up a week later or ten days later or a month later, we would actually encourage them to go back to that, right? But the Prophet Sallallahu response was to facilitate for her and to alleviate for her the pressure of having to hold to this uh, litany of hers. And she, con she continued in that. She still continued in that. But she would replace her with this dua. Right? This dua then became her litany that she would make uh, constantly. So she was known to be uh, uh, very devout in this way. And then the Prophet married Um Habiba, the daughter of Abu Sufyan. Um Habiba, the daughter of whom? <laughs> Abu Sufyan. Right? So Um Habiba was married to Ubaidullah ibn, uh, uh, ibn Jash, who was the uh, brother of Zainab bin Tajash. Right? So Um Habiba is the former sister-in-law of Zainab bin, bin Tajash. Right? The former sister-in-law of Zainab bin Tajash. So through her brother, right, she married her brother. Right? And so she was the sister-in-law. And then once he died, she became the former sister of That's what we mean. So he, um, uh, he was known to be one of the Hunafa, one of those who did not ever bow down to an idol. He didn't like bowing down to the bowing down. He didn't like the idols. He didn't, never, never did that. And so when the Prophet ﷺ began to call to Tawheed, he became Muslim along with his wife. Right? And he was one of those who went to Abyssinia and he settled in Abyssinia. But then he began to change. And uh, she noticed in him that he was coming under the sway of Christian influence. And he, uh, up until the point where he actually became Christian. And he, uh, and he began to drink. Uh, his drinking began, began to sort of overtake him. And he lived the rest of his life alone. He didn't remarry. And so she, uh, she sought divorce from him. She didn't want to remain married to him. And so she, she was divorced. And the Prophet ﷺ, when he heard about this, he sent a servant all the way to Abyssinia. Um, and 
and Najashi, <coughs> right? And Najashi also uh, told Zainab, uh, or sorry, Um Habiba, he told her that she should seek someone to represent her in marriage. And this servant came to an Najashi, telling uh, an Najashi that the Prophet seeks to marry uh, Um Habiba. Right? He seeks to marry Um Habiba. And obviously there's political implications in this marriage. Right? One, Um Habiba was one of the very first people to convert. So she, she was there from the very beginning. And as a, as a way of honoring her, um, she, uh, the Prophet ﷺ, uh, sought to marry her. But also, being the daughter of Abu Sufyan is not incidental. That's not just a coincidence. That, that's, not, that, that's also part of this formula here. That if he's married to the daughter of Abu Sufyan, there are obvious political implications to that. Now, so, the Prophet ﷺ has a Najashi as his representative in this marriage. So an Najashi represents the Prophet in marrying Um Habiba. Right? And an Najashi gives to Um Habiba 400 dinar. And he prepares the wedding feast and everything. And Um Habiba also has a representative who represents her as well. Um, uh, now, and so the, uh, she is married to the Prophet through this long distance arrangement. And then after the, uh, the conquest of Khaybar, when Jafar ibn Abi Talib comes uh, uh, back from, uh, from Abyssinia after the, the Muslims are victorious at Khaybar, he brings with her Um Habiba. And so she comes with Jafar ibn Abi Talib, and the Prophet says, I don't know what I'm more happier about, the, the victory at Khaybar or the, the arrival of Jafar. Uh, and Um Habiba is united with the Prophet at that point. No. Uh, when news of the, the wedding, uh, yeah, I actually agree, when news of this proposal and this, this marriage reached Abu Sufyan, Abu Sufyan said, uh, Basically, he's, he's saying, this, this is, uh, he noted, he, he acknowledges that this is a great blessing indeed, that, uh, that there couldn't have been a more nobler, uh, honorable uh, 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 man for my daughter, right? And he was still not Muslim at that time. He was still not Muslim at that time. There are a few things from Abu Sufyan that are that are pretty astounding. The Prophet and Mut'am ibn Adi, when the Prophet Sallallahu after Ta'if goes back to uh, to the Kaaba, and he's surrounded by Mut'am ibn Adi and his seven sons. They all they all have their swords around the Prophet Sallallahu and he, they tell him. Go make your tawaf around the Kaaba, and he makes his tawaf around the Kaaba. Says, after Ta'if, Abu Sufyan comes out and he says, uh, 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 he says, Mujirun uh, Anta uh, and He says, Are you uh, protecting him or have you converted? And he says, Ben Mujir. He says, Rather, I'm just providing my protection. So Abu Sufyan says, Idan Ajarna Man Ajarka. Right? He says, Then then we provide our protection for, our, for, for, uh, for the one who enjoys your protection. And he says that to a Mutan. So the Prophet his last years in, in Mecca, is enjoying the protection of Abu Sufyan. Of Abu Sufyan. There's a couple very interesting dynamics with Abu Sufyan there. And obviously you guys all know that Abu Sufyan gave his eyes in, uh, in, in one of the battles after uh, after having accepted uh, the faith, he loses his eye uh, in one of the battles. And he comes to the Prophet after his eye, his eye uh, comes, he has his eye in his hand. And he tells the Prophet And the Prophet says, I can, I, can, I can restore it for you, or you will have a great, much greater uh, uh, reward in Jannah if you're patient. And Abu Sufyan throws it on the ground and he steps on it. So Abu Sufyan is, you know, he's mu'min, haqqan, mu'min, haqqan. And his son Muawiyah was one of the Qutab al wahi He was one of the scribes of the Prophet So, um, after this, the Prophet marries Safiya bint Huyay. And Safiya bint Huyay uh, was 
uh, one of the, she was the daughter of uh, the, the uh, master, the, the, the master of his people, of, of Ben al-Nadir, right? Uh, ben al-Nadir, sorry, Ben al-Nadir. Uh, she is the daughter of Hayyay ibn, ibn Akhtab, and he was the chief of Ben al-Nadir. Uh, so in the battle of uh, Khaybar, uh, her, uh, I'm sorry, um, she was married to uh, Kinana ibn Abi uh, Hatib, who was killed in the battle of Khaybar, and she did not have um, uh, children with him. So Safiya falls in the, uh, like after the battle of Banu Qurayla and the battle of uh, Banu Nadir, uh, she falls into the, uh, among the prisoners of war uh, of the Prophet And uh, she is given to one of the companions, right, as, as the prisoner of war. But because of her status as the daughter of the chief of Banu Nadir, the Prophet وسلم, uh, uh, goes to that companion, or has word sent to that companion, that Safiya should be wed to the Prophet right? And again, there's deep political implications for that marriage, that this is the daughter of the chief of uh, the of Banu Nadir. It's not appropriate that she should be uh, wed, uh, or that she should remain as a slave or concubine of uh, the uh, the one of the one of uh, just a random companion. But she is the wife of the Prophet That has social uh, implications, political implications uh, that uh, are, are profound. And it's through such a marriage that the Prophet has people like Abdullah ibn Abi ibn Salam, right, who, the Rabbi Abdullah ibn Salam. And other prominent Jews become Muslim through this type of relationship now that they have with the Prophet through marriage. Right? And, and uh, Abdullah ibn Salam, when he has his, his son, uh, he brings his son to the Prophet and the Prophet does the tahniq for him. He, he puts the dates in, in his, in his, uh, along, along his gums and everything, and he names his son Yusuf. Right? He names him Yusuf in honor of his Jewish heritage. Right? Uh, so we, we find that uh, Safiya then is wed to the Prophet and uh, there's a few dynamics now that are introduced into the prophetic household as a result. The Prophet is now having to deal with not just the jealousy of his wife, but it gets now to the point where it becomes, uh, you know, it becomes this ridicule that the wives have for Safiya, being that she is the only non-Arab among them who's Jewish, right? And so they begin to talk about her in this fashion. On one of the, uh, on one occasion, the um, the uh, the Prophet Sallallahu goes out with uh, I forget who it is it's Zaina it's Zaina oh no let me not say that I forget who it was but. Um, the Prophet it's, a, it's in another section. One of the Prophet's wives had a lot of um, camels, and uh, the camel of Safiya um, got sick on one of the. Uh, do you know who it was? The, she had a lot of camels, and, and the, the Prophet uh, the, the, the camel of Safiya got sick and couldn't continue in the journey. And so he asked for this wife to send uh, to her sister, um, uh, Safiya, uh, one of her camels. Uh, he did. So he could have actually done it himself. He could have commanded her to do so, but this was the property of his wife. Right? And so he didn't impose himself in that, but he said, it would be a good thing if you could send your sister Safiya a one of the and he says, Ukhtaki, Ukhtaki, right? Your sister Safiya, uh, one of your camels. And she said, Ila uh, Yahudiyatik, to your Jewish wife, to your to your Jewish woman, right? You want me to send a camel to your Jewish woman? Like he set it up. He set it up as to your sister, right? And and what did he mean by that? 
What did he mean by that? This is not something that he would normally refer to one of the co-wives as the sister. He would not do that. But because Safiya was receiving such ridicule, and she was sort of the outcast because of her Jewish heritage, or Jewish blood, he is, he is accentuating that point, emphasizing that point that she is your sister. In Islam, she is your sister. She is also your co-wife. She, she is my wife. right? So it would be a good thing to loan her one of your camels. And she says, to your Jewish woman, and the Prophet ﷺ falls silent. And the day that he is supposed to come back to that wife, and I'm sorry, I don't, I, I don't remember who it was, uh, the day that he's supposed to come back to that wife, and because he's doing, he's going every day with a different wife, he doesn't come to her. And then the next time he doesn't come to her again. A, a good month Zainab goes by. Zainab bin Jash. Yeah, I'll lay back. Zainab bin Jash. So he doesn't come back to her uh, until she falls into a state of despair, right? The, the not, not, he's not going to come back. And then he finally comes back to her, but he makes no mention of it. And she makes no mention of anything either. She got the point. She got the point. But she never talks about Sophia after that. Right? She never talks to her about, about Sophia thereafter. Uh, they, on another occasion, uh, they 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 call Sophia Yahudiya, right? But they call her that not. I mean, not just saying oh, Jewish woman, but a Jewess, right? With with this scorn in their in their face, and so. She complains to the Prophet and she says, Ya Rasulullah, you know, this is what the wives are, your wives are doing. So he says, and he doesn't rebuke them. He doesn't chide them. He doesn't engage this, right? But he said, the next time they do this, tell them that your father is a prophet and that your uncle is a prophet and that your husband is a prophet. <laughs> huh? In other words, Look at how Allah has honored me, right? Look at how Allah has honored me. That, you, that, that my father and my uncle, my, my father Moses and my uncle Harun, right? Aaron, they are both prophets, right? These people that you're talking, that you're reciting about, that you're reciting the Quran. Every time you recite a story of Musa, every time you recite a story of Harun, just imagine, after, after you've been told that, Every time any of those wives who scorned her recited anything about Musa or Harun, who are they thinking about? Safiya. <laughs> it's already there now. You can't get, you can't you can't forget that. You can't you can't remove that thought from your mind. And and you'll never be able to recite those verses the same way again. So the Prophet created that space in their mind. So that any time the name Musa or Harun is mentioned, they're thinking, who? Oh, Safiya. And it creates this space of love in their hearts for Safiya now. Right? And that your father, that your husband is a prophet as well. Right? So she she now she is he is uplifting her. Where she was feeling, you know, scorned, she was feeling put down, he uplifts her and he raises her status above theirs. He raises her status above theirs. And look how beautiful he honors her. And look, how, look in what beautiful manner he honors her. And this is part of our legacy. This is part of... Uh, and, and then uh, on one occasion, they would, and this is before that, because they never, they never scorned her after that. But before that whole uh, thing, on one occasion, they... Uh, they uh, oh, no, no, this was... I'm sorry. I'll take that back. On the Prophet's deathbed, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, uh, Safiya remarks that, Ya Rasulullah, if only that which has overcome you came to me instead. If only it came to me instead. And the wives of the Prophet ﷺ who were in her presence look at one another and, you know, they wink. Right? They wink to one another. And so the Prophet ﷺ told, her, told them, go and rinse. He, he can barely speak. He can barely speak. And he tells the wives, go and rinse your mouths. He said, why Ya Rasulullah? Why Ya Rasulullah? In any shape. And he said, from your, from your winking. From your winking, go and rinse your mouths. Right? That, that, was, that was gossip. Right? That was gossip. That was, that was akin to gossip. Right? So you've eaten her 
flesh, because I know nothing about what she says except that it's the truth. But what she says is true. And she she does wish that this came to her and not to me. And I know that she's true and honest about that. And so look at the honor that he's giving her. Look at that honor that he's giving her. You know, alhamdulillah. So she died in the year 50. Uh, and then we have Umar Mu'mineen Maymuna bin Zilharat, and she's the 11th of the wives. Uh, Umar Mu'mineen, uh, Zainab. So Maymuna was, um, uh, she was, you know, there's only a couple of things that we have to share about Maymuna in the interest of time here. Uh, I could give you a rundown of her biography, but we really do have to cut it short because we also have Nadia and Naifan. Um So Maimuna, one of the things that happened in her house is that Ibn Abbas was related to Maimuna, she was his aunt. Uh, he, he mentions the prayer of the Prophet Sallallahu that happened in her house, in which he, met, he prayed with the Prophet Sallallahu and it took him all of, uh, in the first rak'ah, he recited all of Baqarah, and, and then he bowed down for the same amount of time so that it took him to recite all of Surah and Baqarah. And then he stood up and, 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 and it took that same amount of time. His standing took the same amount of time. And he was saying, Subhan Rabbi and Aleem, Subhan Rabbi. But no, he, he was saying, um, um, uh, I, I forgot the, the dua that he was saying when, when he stood up again. But it took the same amount of time. And then his, his uh, sujood, his prostration, the same amount of time that it took to recite Surah and Baqarah. This, this prayer happened in the house of Maimuna. No. Uh, also, one of the things that happened in the house of Maimuna is that they brought to him, uh, there, there was uh, people who came to him uh, as visitors, and they brought with them um, grilled lizards. And so the Prophet Sallallahu when he asked what are, you know, he, you know, he was told that these are, you know, the, the, well, it was obvious what they were, and the Prophet Sallallahu you know, just, refused to eat from it. And they said, Ya Rasulullah, is it, is it haram? We can't eat it. He said, this is just not what, you know, he said, Laysa min ta'am qawmi, right? This is not from what my people eat. My people don't eat this. Right? And qawmi is basically my, you know, where I'm from, back in Mecca, right? The, 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 we don't eat this, right? So, <laughs> so but, but by all means, right? And so they all ate, right? they all ate. Alhamdulillah. So then we have um, Rayhana, and Nadia Very, very briefly, Rehana uh, was uh, one of the uh, one of the uh, uh, concubines from Banu Qurayza, and the Prophet Sallallahu offered marriage to her, and he said that if you if you like that that, that, that we can marry. Uh, one of the ways that they knew that a person was married or not was if they had a hijab or not, if they actually wore the niqab. And so, so uh, this was one of the distinctions that the, the Jawali did not, um, the, the wives did. And so uh, she did not, she's, she preferred, she said, Ya Rasulullah, I would prefer that you would uh, to, to remain uh, as your concubine uh, because I cannot fulfill your rights upon me and I don't want you to worry about fulfilling your, my rights upon you. So I would much rather remain as, as your concubine. And she refused to accept Islam in the beginning. And this, you know, bothered the Prophet Sallallahu But then she embraced uh, the faith uh, thereafter, uh, and, um, and she was buried in Rabia. Um Then the Prophet Sallallahu also received as a gift from uh, Muqawqas in, uh, in Egypt, the governor in Egypt, he received a gift of a, a doctor, a, uh, a, a, uh, a slave, uh, two concubines, and uh, who were sisters, Nadia and her sister Sirin, and also a donkey, a very healthy, robust donkey. And it was this donkey that the Prophet called Dundun, right? Uh, and Dundun means porcupine. So he, he received the donkey, but he named him porcupine. Uh, and so the uh, uh, Nadia and Sirin, the, 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 the one who was bringing them from Egypt, right? This was a gift that was given to one of the Muslims who had gone to Egypt, and when he was coming back, he was speaking to them about the Prophet and about the, who he was, and so they became Muslim on the way. Hmm? Yeah, this is it. 
they became Muslim. They became Muslim on the way, and then when they came to the Prophet uh, obviously Aisha, when she once she saw Maria, uh, she she just you know she was uh, she had that same reaction against her. Um, the Prophet uh, wed not wed, but he gifted Sirin to Hassan ibn Thabit, his uh, his poet, the poet warrior. He freed the slave. He accepted the donkey. He sent the doctor back with a note uh, saying, "Nahnu kawman la na'kulu hatta najua." We are we are people who do not eat and, and unless we are hungry. And when we are when we eat, we don't fill our stomachs. Right? So the doctor had basically nothing to do there in Medina. He would have, he wouldn't have had anything to do in Medina. Right? Okay. Like just imagine going to medical school and learning all this stuff, and then there's nobody who's coming to you with any sickness. Or anything. Like we've got this thing taken care of. Right? Uh, so he went back, right? And so Maria is the only woman to give birth to any of the Prophet's uh, children, uh, besides Khadija, and she uh, gives him Ibrahim. And the Prophet ﷺ would go and visit uh, Ibrahim uh, often, and he would smell him. And he would take him from his wet nurse and give him back, and, and, and he would spend time with, uh, with Maria there. Uh, she became Umwala. Right? She became Umwala. And basically, if you have a concubine, uh, the, uh, that, uh, uh, that, um, the, through her giving birth, she is no longer uh, the, sad, the status of a concubine, but she is called Umwala, which means that she is now, she's in this middle space where. She has all of the rights of, uh, of a wife without having to fulfill all of the obligations of a wife. And her children are born free. So it breaks the cycle of concubinage, uh, of concubinage it breaks the cycle of, uh, of slavery. It breaks the cycle of slavery. Uh, and that's an institution that the Prophet himself brought to bear. Right? That was not there before. That was not instituted before. And so um, we find in this, just very briefly to, to, to comment on this, very briefly, uh, the Prophet Sallallahu had to live an example for all possible scenarios of people who were there at that time. For, for the monogamy, for, for, the, for the celibate, he had to exemplify celibacy. And so he lived up until the time he was 25 celibate, which was unheard of at that time. Where you can have all kinds of you know relationships with, and it's it's just it's unrestricted, and the youth of, uh, especially as a young man growing up in a in a in a society where there was where there was no limits on the number of uh, slave girls one could one could have to be celibate up until the time you're 25, and then marry someone who's 40, right? He exemplified what it is to be celibate, and he exemplified what it is to be monogamous. Because he was married to Khadija for, for 25 years. And had Khadija remained, he would not have married anyone else. Khadija offers the Prophet to marry, and he doesn't marry. She offers him uh, uh, concubines, and he doesn't take concubines. So he lives that life of monogamy with Khadija throughout all of their marriage. And then polygyny, a person who is in a state where he has more than one wife, he is the example for that as well. And for people who had concubines, he was the example for that. And where, where those, those concubines would uh, give birth, he was the example for that. And when that, those concubines would not give birth, he was the example for that. So he fulfilled all of the roles for every possible situation of marriage or concubinage for every man who was there in Medina so that they knew exactly how to bring to all of those relationships the quintessential, exquisite ethic of, uh, of, of, uh, of nobility, integrity, of chivalry, of, 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 um, of, uh, of how to deal with those situations. So he had, he had slaves, and he also freed slaves. So he could exemplify every possible role uh, in that, uh, in that uh, social, um, in that social, uh, that, in, the, in the way that that social, um, as, uh, what am I trying to say? Huh? Uh, you know, to, uh, in, in that social dynamic that they were living back in those days, right? 
they lived it. The prophesied son didn't bring concubinage. He didn't bring polygamy. He didn't bring slavery and institute these things as part and parcel of what Islam brings to a society when it comes in. All of that was just, that was how the society, that, that's what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was born into, right? And so he exemplified every possible way of uh, managing those relationships with uh, the utmost degree of character and ethics and nobility. Uh, and that was from the great wisdom uh, of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala in arranging those. Even, even marrying the, uh, the, the, the wives of your adopted son who divorced them. Even that was, that had to be exemplified. You see what I'm saying? Uh, in his own personal way. So with that, I just wanted to you know, shed light on, on, on that because there, there may be a lot of questions that uh, have gone unanswered. I feel like I'm going to say that 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 I'm going to سيدنا محمد سيد الأولين والآخرين وعلى صحابته ومن تبعه في أحسان إلى يوم الدين اللهم جعلنا في المجرد بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم So there are many aspects to describe the Prophet's family life at home صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم So I have to be very selective especially given the talk How do you condense 63 years 61 solar years, how do you condense that into four hours? Uh, it's impossible, you cannot. All we can do is take glimpses, and from those glimpses draw, uh, draw out implications and draw out uh, as much as we can for uh, our own benefit in a limited time. But this is really a lifelong study, uh, studying the home life of the Prophet <coughs> is one of the ways, one of the best ways, I think, to, um, to, uh, to draw close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we want to go back to that theme of the blessing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given each and every one of us in our husbands, and in our wives, in our fathers, in our mothers, in our children, in our siblings, because these are the people to whom we are bound. And if you think about the Arabic language, it's so fascinating. Uh, the words that we have in the Arabic language for family um, have this running theme throughout them, uh, which is to cling or adhere to something. So you take the word for a'ila, which is an extended family, a'ila. Well, let's start very, let's start small with tif, right? Tif is a baby. But tufayl is a parasite, a blood sucker, right? That's a tufayl. And the word for baby is related to the word for parasite. Because that parasite clings on to you and it sucks your blood, right? You, you become the source for their life. Just like that baby will cling on to the breast of the mother and suckle for its dear life, right? So the word for parasite, the cling on, right, is the same word that we have for baby. <clears throat> and you take that further and you go to brother. Ach. And ach is related to athia, and athia is a rope by which you tie your horse to a peg in the ground, right? That's a rope, and, and so that horse cannot break free from that peg. It becomes an un... You can, that, that horse is bound, right, to that peg, just like that baby is bound 
to its mother or father. And then you go a little bit further and you say, okay, the word for family, that nuclear family, is usra, right? And an usra is, all, is related to the word asir, which is a captive or a prisoner of war, right? Who, uh, who is bound to you, right? As the victor in that battle, that <coughs> prisoner is bound to you now. And in a, in a society that practices slavery, that prisoner becomes essentially your slave, right? Cannot come out of that relationship except through formal means, uh, manumitting himself or you freeing him. But in other words, that slave is bound, right? Uh, and then you go from there to an extended family. And an extended family is the word, the word for that is ha'ila. Uh, Ayil is a person who is dependent on someone else. Right? Ala ya'ulu means to, to be dependent on someone, uh, bound to that person for your sustenance. Right? So you have this, this running theme throughout all of these words that are not related in terms of their roots. Tafala, right? Asara, awala, acha, achawa. These are not related roots, but they're all related through this running theme throughout them, which is to cling on to something and to be bound to it. <clears throat> Allah SWT has set the situation up to where a person cannot divorce their parents, they cannot divorce their children, they cannot get out of that relationship. And even if, even if a person sort of walks out and moves across town, right, they are legally obliged to take care of those people, right, until they die. Until they die, they are the responsibility of those people. Like the the the, the, the parents or the, the children are the responsibility of the parents until they become of age, and then it reverses. The parents are the responsibility of the children until the parents die. You see what I'm saying? We are bound in those relationships. So this the the, the dynamic of these relationships is such that Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. At the end of these relationships, there is Jannah. And he puts Jannah under the feet of the mother specifically. Right? And so my ticket out and into the Divine Presence is only through my wife. It's only through my husband. It's only through my parents. It's only through my children. And my morning litany, as I reach, as I begin every day, is, O oh Allah, not me, but I'm saying in general, should be, Oh Allah, enable me to be the Jannah of the people you have, you have surrounded me with. In order me to be, uh, enable me to be a meadow of heaven for my wife. Enable me to be a meadow of heaven for my husband. Enable me to be a meadow of heaven for my parents. Enable me to be a meadow of heaven a safe haven for my children, right? Because through them, your character is refined. It's only through them. Think about your siblings. Think about your parents. Think about your spouses. It is only through those people that your character is refined. It's not refined over lunch. It's not refined as you sit in this room. It's not re all the homework is done at home. All the homework is done at home, right? So, <clears throat> where do we begin? Right? I mean, what, what can we say about the Prophet's home life, except to take glimpses of this beautiful life that he led, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and to use them, inshallah, as a means to inspire ourselves to embody these principles. <coughs> The Prophet is the example, and a lot of times when we think about uh, how the Prophet was at home, there's a hadith that comes to our mind, right? And what is that hadith? It's the hadith that you expected to hear at this lecture today, right? As you were driving your car, or as you were thinking about, should I attend this class or not? There's a certain hadith that sort of comes into our minds, right? What is that hadith? about how the Prophet was at home. Uh, louder, please, louder. Be good to your family and I'm the one who is the best 
Okay, that's a beautiful thing. Yes. There's another one. No, that's about the character. I'm talking about the the prophet at home. Yes. He wouldn't say no. He wouldn't say no. Maybe I'm not asking the question uh, clearly. <clears throat> when we think about the idea of the prophet at home and what he used to do at home, there's a certain hadith that rises to prominence. Can a female? Yeah. Can a female? That the prophet was in the service of his family. He was in the service of his family, right? That's usually the hadith that we will hear about this, and it's usually the only hadith that we will hear about this. And that hadith is usually mentioned to remind men to serve their wives, right? So pretty much, you know, the, the, the men, whenever they hear it, they say, okay, here we go again. <laughs> right, take a deep breath, right? And the women are saying, see, see, you know, see. So this is the hadith that you don't want the khatib or the or the the uh, teacher to to really dwell on too long, right? Just uh, mention it. You can mention it, but it's okay to, to mention other things before and after. You know, so it sort of blends in, right? Um, I would like to take a step back from that because I think that's problematic. The way that this hadith is used and taught, and the way that this hadith is received and the expectations that we place on a hadith like this, that he was in the service of his family. Uh, because <clears throat> the way that we have done, uh, gone about the, the pedagogy of this hadith, if you will, is that this hadith relates to men serving or not serving uh, their wives at home. Right? Um, and yes, on the surface, that's true. But I dare say that this hadith applies to men and to women. Is not the Prophet ﷺ the example for both the men and the women? He's the example for both. Right? Uh, the Prophet ﷺ is the example for both the men and the women. And the whole purpose of being in close proximity to these family members is to serve them. Whether or not you're a man or a woman or a son or a daughter, or the, the parents are in the service of their children. And then the children are in the service of their parents. The wife is in the service of her husband. And the husband is in the service of his wife. And so, what is going on with this service then? Well, what is, what is really at, at, the, at, the, at the core of this is love. This hadith is all about love. Because if you love someone, you will serve them. And the Prophet ﷺ loved his wives. And he served them. And he loved his siblings, uh, in, uh, in, in, in uh, uh, sorry, not his siblings, he loved uh, his servants, and he served them. There were many things that the servants would have done, but the Prophet would, would take up for himself. Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha walks in on him several times, and he find, she finds him mending his own clothing, and she says, if you would only let the servants do that. We have servants. But one of those servants was Zayd, who was gifted to Khadija. And the Prophet ﷺ, she gifted him to the Prophet ﷺ, and he became the adopted son. In the time of Khadija, the Prophet ﷺ is mending his own clothing, which is not the, the work of free men. Right? That's not the habit of free men in that society. That's why you have servants. right? And she would say, if you just Give, the, give this to one of the servants. And the Prophet ﷺ would look at her smiling and continue mending the clothing. Right? So he was in the service of his servants. Right? So the whole point about this is not just how men should be at home. Yes, that is, that is, there's a lot to be learned there. But it's also how women should be in the service of their husbands. How women should be in the service of their parents and their children. How, women, how, how men should be in the service of their wives, and how men should be in the service of their parents and their children as well. The whole family is coming together to serve. And the, what we see in the Prophet is that whatever needed to be done, he just did it. And there is constantly things that had to be done right, in a house. In a house, and running a household, there's a hundred things that just have to be done right, to keep that household running, smoothly, to keep everything clean, to keep everything organized, to keep everything just 
going from, you know, to keep the routine going, you know, where there's not you know, all this clutter around and all this, and especially they didn't have clutter back then, but we definitely had some clutter, right? So basically the principle is that the Prophet said that if there was anything to be done, he did it. Right? And if there was anything that his wives needed help with, he helped. Right? Which also, which goes across, it goes across, and so he's not just the example, the point I'm trying to make is that he's not just the example for men here, but he's also the example for the women as well. Um, and so, specifically, specifically, we do have uh, admonition and advice directed toward the men, specifically, right? And the Prophet has said in the hadith that one of the, that you mentioned, خَيْرُكُمْ خَيْرُكُمْ لِلِسَعِي وَخَيْرُكُمْ خَيْرُكُمْ لِأَهْلِي Right? The best of you are those who are best to their women. Right? To their women. Which doesn't mean to their wives. It means to their women. Right? He didn't say لِزَوْجَاتِي Right? لِأَزْوَاجِي He didn't say, right, لِأَهْلِي He did say لِأَهْلِي in other narrations. And أَهْلِ is either wives or it's greater family. Right? But he said, خَيْرُكُمْ خَيْرُكُمْ لِنِسَائِي in another hadith. Which includes then the mothers, and it includes the sisters. It includes the wives, it includes the daughters, it includes the aunts. Any woman in your household, if you want to reach the, the pinnacle of character, of virtuous character, then the best of you are the best to all of those women, not just the wives. Not just the wives, but to all of those women. Right? To all of those women. No matter what. No matter what. I have, we, we have someone in our midst here. No matter what. It doesn't matter what day of the week, what, 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 uh, what, what's going on that day. There is a ritual that he has that at a certain hour of the day, he's going to pick up the phone and call his mother. That's, what he, that's just what he does. He's always done that. Here, someone here in this room. Right? It doesn't matter. He can. You can have the greatest shape at a maulid or a, con a conference or something like that. In the middle of his speech, he will leave and get on the phone for a 20, 30 minute conversation with his mother. Right. So th this is the type of honor <coughs> that the Prophet ﷺ is conferring specifically to the women. Uh, that uh, that by which the men are now measuring themselves. If they want to know where do I stand with Allah, the barometer for that is where do I stand with my women? Where do I stand with my mother? Where do I stand with my wife? Where do I stand with my daughters? Where do I stand with my, my sisters? How do they, where, what place do I have in their heart? And that is a good indication of where I am with Allah in terms of character. Right? So specifically, he meant the men, right? Uh, in, in such a hadith. And this is very important that, that these hadith, khayrukum khayrukum yunisa'ihim, these hadith are utterly revolutionary in a time that they were living in, where women were, were inherited just like property. Where women were, we've read, that where, where women were, were traded on a, on a slave market. You could go and buy a woman. Right? That's the, that's, that's how the past was, right? And over time, the rulings of the Prophet ﷺ and the rulings of Sharia over time are going to uh, phase all of that out. Phase it all out. And this requires us to, to take a, a step back a little bit. Uh, someone asked me in the Q&A session a uh, question regarding slaves and uh, the, neither the Prophet وسلم, nor Jibreel وسلم, nor Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his revelation instituted slavery. But slavery was always there. It regulated it with a strong uh, encouragement to phase it out over time. Right? With a strong encouragement to phase it out over time. But it was a necessity of that time in a, in a place where you had uh, battle after battle after battle, where men were being uh, slaughtered and slain on the battlefield, and you had an overwhelming uh, number, ratio, of women to men in an, in an environment where 
uh, people did not have protection for themselves. There weren't, it was tribal, right? But there was also the threat of imminent danger just on this highway robbers. You couldn't tra travel from place to place without protection, and this is for the men and the women. So it was in the best interest of many people to be the clients or the slaves of a, of a certain clan or tribe, and to, to receive the, the protection and the guarantees afforded them through that relationship. Now, there were great abuses that the Prophet ﷺ came and he outlawed. One of them is if you ever strike a slave, then that is immediate freedom for that slave. They are immediately free if you were ever to strike a slave. Right? And their rights were, and we can go through this, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but you, they eat from what you eat from, they dress from what you dress, and Sayyidu Qawmi Khadimun. The Prophet ﷺ said that the master of the, of the people is the one who serves them. Right? As a slave, hearing that, what does that do? What does that do for you as a slave, hearing that? Right? that and, and for random sins, random sins in the Quran, in the book of Allah SWT, random sins, the expiation for it, the forgiveness, you want forgiveness from Allah SWT, free a slave. But wait a minute, what does that have to do with fasting? Intentionally breaking my fast, what, or, 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 or swearing an oath and not keeping it. What does freeing a slave have to do with that? There's got to be some other spiritual, like, like send me to the mountains for a week or something like that to contemplate and meditate my state and how horrible of a person I am because I lie about the oath that I, you know, In order to get on the good side of God, I've got to go find a slave and free him? So if that is the ethos, if that's sort of what's being taught, then how are these same men going to go into the slave market and buy slaves? So over time, this sort of phases itself out, right, over time. And there's so many issues that we, we can address regarding this, but the, the point, um, uh, I think, um, just to keep in mind, is that we cannot judge whatsoever the past by the values and the ideals of the present. And uh, over time, for many reasons, uh, and for many divine wisdoms, uh, over time this issue became phased out, such that uh, now we don't have uh, slavery, and it would be totally against the Sharia to try to revive that aspect of the Sira. Because the, the Sunnah of the Prophet was not to institute it. It wasn't to bring slavery to people who didn't have slavery. Right? It was to phase it out wherever it was. Right? To phase it out wherever it was. Now, so, yeah, we, we mentioned this just in light of restoring to the woman the honor that was, uh, that, that was hers all along. Yeah. So, then we get into some of the anecdotes that we have prepared, inshallah, for you. Um, the Prophet The Prophet would converse with his Lord. He would pray to his Lord about uh, the responsibilities uh, that he had, and he would say, "Allahumma inna hada qasmi fi ma amlik, fala tu aqidni fi ma la amlik." Oh Allah, this is the best that I can do in terms of what is under my what is in my control. So do not take me for what is outside of my control. Right? And what he meant by that is the, you know, I'm, I, I give to my wives exactly uh, the, 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 the time that each of them is entitled to, to the best of my ability. So do not take me to account for that which is not in my control, which is my, my heartfelt attachment to some of them over others. No? Uh, one of the things about this that is so fascinating is that there's Allah SWT revealed a verse in the book of Allah, in his book, that allows the Prophet to distribute his time among his wives in any way he saw fit. To, to skip the visitation of some of his wives if he saw fit. To replace the day of one of his wives with the day of another of his wives as he saw fit. To not go to 
some of his wives as he saw fit. The, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives him that permission. And on in, in the last two weeks of his blessed life, وسلم, he is with Maymuna, and the pain comes to him, right? And he asks Maymuna's permission to go and spend his last days in the, uh, in the house of Aisha. And he goes to each one of his wives and seeks their permission to spend his last days in the house of Aisha at the end of his life. And that is, that, that is only after living for years, having never taken the license that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him in the, in, in the Quran. That even though he had that choice, even though he could have done anything that he wanted in terms of arranging that, uh, the, the visitation, he never once uh, took that license. But he would give everyone the, 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 uh, the fair, fair amount of time uh, in, in accordance with his ability to do so. And he was taking care of families. He was taking care of all of these women and their families. Right? Um, and so, uh, this, this, on one occasion though, we do have, uh, on one occasion he spent a little bit more time with, um, I believe it was Safiya, who had uh, that honey, right? Is that Safiya? No, not Safiya, sorry. That was... Uh, hmm? The honey. No, not Maria. No, no uh, Zainab bin Tijah. Zainab bin Tijah. Okay, let's go with that. Um, so he spent a little bit of time with Zainab bin Tijah. A little longer. Uh, she had this type of this beautiful honey that you can like. Um, and he spent a little bit of time with Zainab bin Tijah. A little longer. She had this type of this beautiful honey that he liked. And so the other wives got together and they said he sp he spent a little too long there. What we should tell him is that. When he goes, uh, when he when he visits you after Zainab bin Tijash, then you should ask him, you know, if he's been eating manaki. Uh, uh, I forgot the, the name of the word, but uh, if he had eaten from a certain plant that had a, a putrid odor, right? a certain food that had a putrid odor, uh, and uh, maybe he'll stop going, uh, he'll stop spending that much time at the Zainabs. And so they did this. And he heard from more than one of his wives, Zainab bin Tijaj. And so he, 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 uh, he heard from more than one of his wives the same thing. And they sort of deceived him in that. And uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed a verse on that account. right? On that account. And he said, because he said, I'll never go, I'll never eat that again. I'll never eat it again. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals the verse uh, to the Prophet said, Why do you forbid what Allah has permitted you? Uh, so uh, sometimes it took divine revelation just to just to resolve the conflict. <laughs> no. So on several occasions, on several occasions, Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha is asked, and the reason that she is asked is because she is the one who has. From the Prophet she is the one who is teaching the most. She's teaching more than all of the other wives of the Prophet She relates 2,200 some hadith from the Prophet If you combine all of the hadith that all of the wives of the Prophet relate from him, it doesn't amount to one third of what Aisha relates from the Prophet So she is she's the one who's being asked. And they come to Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha and they ask her, they, they, these are on several occasions, these men come to the Messenger to, to, to Aisha after his passing, and they ask, This question was asked several times of Aisha, and every time she gives a different response, right? highlighting a different detail of the Prophet's life, whatever she remembered at the time. Um, and on one occasion, she says, "Kana yakunu fi mehnati ali." Kana yakunu fi mehnati ali. In another narration of that, "Kana fi mehnati ali." Right? He was in the service of his family. But "Kana yakunu fi mehnati ali" is a little bit different. Right? That he was constantly in the service of his family. This wasn't incidental. He didn't just have a good month one year. 
where he was just helping out around the house. But he was consistently in the service of his family, consistently. Um, his service was such that whatever was needed, he would just do it. And it was very difficult for him to actually ask for things to be done. It was very difficult. Now, he did have Sayyidina Hanas who was there. And Sayyidina Hanas was so in tune with the Prophet's need that, Sayyidina, that, that he was just, that, that, uh, and Hanas was there from, from the time that he was 10 to until the time he was 20. That the Prophet Sallallahu scarcely had to ask him that uh, for Anas learned throughout the years how to beautifully serve the Messenger Sallallahu One of the things about this that should be mentioned uh, when we say that he was constantly in the service of his family is that also his family was constantly in his service. We tend to forget that, right? That his, his family was constantly in his service as well. And this is a very good reminder to, especially the men here, because I think the women by default are uh, giving in that capacity, in terms of uh, raising the children, serving the children, the needs of the children, and also usually the domestic affairs fall on their shoulder. So they are already in the service of their husbands and fathers and, and their children. And so the, the men have to be in their service as well because they recognize that the women are in their service. The husbands have to be in the service of their wives because the wives are in the service of their husbands. So this was a two-way two -way street. The focus is usually on the Prophet in this hadith, that he was in the service of his wives. But what were his wives doing? What were his, in the service of his wives as they were in his service? And and in this respect, we get different hadith where Aisha even says that and he would even cut the meat with them, with the chop, chop up meat with them in the kitchen, right? Or, quote unquote, I projected that. They, they didn't have kitchens. And, and, you know, but, but wherever they were doing the, the chopping of the meat, the Prophet would chop the meat with them. Who are they chopping that meat for? The Prophet. So they are in his service. And so he is serving them as they serve him. He is facilitating for them the service that they are offering to him. And so there is mutual service that's going on, where the husband is recognizing this beautiful service from the wife, and the wife is receiving the help of the husband as, uh, as she is trying to serve him in the best way that she can. Right? In other words, break it all down to one word, Love, 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 love. That's where it comes from. That's where it comes from. Love. Right? Service is an, it's a manifestation of love. If you love someone, you serve them. Plain and simple. If you love someone, you serve them. If you love your teachers, you serve them. If you love your parents, you serve them. If you love your children, you serve them. And, and, and at that service is sacrifice. You sacrifice for them. Wallahi ma dhukir al-habibu that al muhibbi illa illa wa adha waliha mashallah. I swear by Allah, the beloved is not mentioned in the presence of the lover except that he sacrifices drunk and out of his wits. Sacrifice. Just by the mere mention of the, of the name of the beloved, he's ready to sacrifice. Ain al muhibbun al ladina alayhi mu badhim mu fusima and fatisihana. Where are those types of lovers? who consider the sacrifice of everything they own and their very own selves yet insignificant. Where are those lovers? She said he was constantly in the service of his family. Uh, but when the prayer was called, he would leave for the prayer. In another narration, she says that, he would, that his face would change. And it's as though he didn't recognize anyone in front of him. Right? When, when Bilal or Ibn uh, Umm Ibn Umm Matum would call for the Adhan, uh, would make the Adhan, it's as though he didn't know us. It's as though he didn't even see us in front of him. Right? Because his Lord was calling upon him. And so she says in other narrations that he used to sew his clothing, mend his sandals, uh, he used to milk his uh, goat, and he would serve himself. 
he would serve himself. No. The fact that we have so many narrations indicates to us that this was a major concern for the men who came after the Prophet who had this tremendous task of being the very best to their women. We don't have women asking Aisha, how was the Prophet at home? Right? We have men asking Aisha, how was the Prophet at home? Men, over and over again, they ask her, how was the Prophet at home? Which shows that their main concern was, how do I become prophetic privately? How do I become prophetic at home? How do I reflect the Prophet's Sunnah where it's not in the public sphere, with those closest and nearest and dearest to me? And this was their main concern. I want to follow the Prophet at home. How can I do that? Tell me what he used to do at home, so that I may do so so that I may bring prophetic light into my house. Light that shines so bright it just bounces off the wall and blinds my wife in her ecstasy. That's what I want to do. I want to bring that prophetic light home. Right? And some of these men had problems in their marriages. Like all marriages have problems. And so they, they're curious. With all these problems I'm having with my wife, how did the Prophet engage his wife? How, what, what was his secret that kept all his marriages uh, intact and that kept all of his marriages blessed? What was his secret? Maybe if I apply some of those secrets, I will have the same results at home. Right? I'll have the same type of dynamic, the same beautiful relationship with my wife at home. And so after hearing this, that he used to serve himself, you find these same people who are asking these questions of Aisha, that if you saw them in public and they were on their, their horses and one of them dropped something, like their whip or something like that, they dropped it, and they're surrounded by people, they would insist on dismounting and picking up that whip and then mounting again. And their servants are there and there and are other people who are around. right? But these men have just been told that he used to be in his own service. He used to serve himself, right? And so this is what we find among those men who asked that question later in public, that they were known, that, that, that it was known about them that they would be in their own service like that. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's compassion with his wives was double that of anything else. And this is the, 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 the Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala says, and we placed between you affection and compassion. Right? Affection and compassion. And the Prophet is right? He is with the faithful, he is kind and compassionate. So the wives of the Prophet had double dosage of that. Right? They had the mawadda and the rahma because they were the wives, and also they had the rahmah that he gave to all the mu'mineen, because they were mu'mineen, right? Uh, so they, they, they enjoyed that, they enjoyed that. And that's why when they were given the choice to divorce him, or to stay married to him, and this choice came after uh, they would complain to the Prophet that, that, that there wasn't enough, that everything that comes in goes out, and they don't have enough for, for what they need. Uh, for, for, uh, for what they want. The Prophet fulfilled all their needs, right? But they wanted beyond their needs, they wanted, they wanted, they wanted the matter to, 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 to expand a little bit, just a little bit. They weren't making too many demands on him. But on one occasion, uh, the pressure was so great that the Prophet ﷺ left his quarters altogether for an entire month. He didn't stay with any one of his wives for an entire month. And the verse comes down giving them all the, op the option of staying in the marriage or of re having their, 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 their marriages dissolved and starting with someone else, whatever they wanted to do. Right? And they, each one of them chose to stay in that marriage. Each one of them. Yeah? And, uh, and in this way, they all partook in that sacrifice. 
in this way. Right? <coughs> About the Prophet Sallallahu if any one of his wives fell ill, he would take care of them personally. Um, on one occasion, the Prophet Sallallahu is with one of his wives and then the, the night comes for Aisha. So he comes into Aisha's uh, quarters, he finds her uh, with her back against the, the against him, uh, and, and she was lying down, um, fake sleeping. And so the Prophet comes and he disrobes and he lies next to her, but then he removes himself from her, puts on his clothing again, and he tiptoes out of the room and leaves. So Aisha gets dressed and she hurries in her, you know, getting dressed and getting ready. She, she, she's, she hastens and she goes and she sees, she's trying to see where the Prophet is going. Is he going back to one of his wives or not? And so the Prophet leaves and she follows him uh, and he heads out to the Baqiya and she follows him and he's praying there at the or he's uh, making dua at the Bukhi. And then he turns, heading back, and she turns, and he walks a little bit briskly, and she walks briskly, and then he starts to jog, and then she starts to jog, and then she starts to run all the way back. And you know how far it is, right? You know how far the Bukhi is from, the, from, the, from where the Prophet is buried. So, so she comes back, she throws off her clothing, gets into, or her, whatever she was dressed in, she gets into the bed the same position, but she's panting a little bit, and she's got this glistening on her, on her forehead from, you know, what, what is going to, uh, the perspiration. And so the Prophet ﷺ comes to her, and he says, Ya Ahish, he says, he says, uh, Hashan Rabia, right? He says, which means, which means basically, uh, you know, What's this glistening, right? What's this glistening? And what is this, what is this uh, uh, acceleration in your breath, right? You're breathing, having your panting. This glistening in this panting, what is this all about? And so she said to the, to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said to her, Ya Aish, right? not Aisha, Ya Aish, right? Taking off the tab of Buddha, one of his nicknames for her. He also called her Al-Humayrak, right? The, the little red one. Right, for her bashfulness, um, for her modesty and her bashfulness. Sayyidina Aisha, I was just mentioning to see the Tariq. Um, you know, toward the, uh, toward the end of her life, as she's on her deathbed, uh, people want to come and spend time with her and give her their last words and receive her last words. Ibn Abbas is one of these people, and she says, don't, I don't want to see Ibn Abbas. And she said, and, 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 uh, and Ibn Abbas insists on coming, she says, no, I don't want to see him because he's, you know, Ibn Abbas has this, this soft tongue, he's going to praise me, and I don't want to hear any of that. Um, in his comfort, Ibn Abbas was, was in, in the way he consoled people, he was very generous with his words, and, uh, and uh, he would try to uplift the spirits. Um, you know, so they, uh, they, uh, so she finally let him in, and so he comes and he says, "Glad tidings to you, Aisha. Glad tidings to you. You are this close to being reunited with the the Prophet Glad tidings to you. You are this, and you are that, and you have this virtue, and that, and you are this, and, right? and he starts to go. There. And so she says, "Daka, da Daka, and have a stop, stop right there, just, just stop." And he said his farewell, he prayed for her, and he left. And then some of the companions came in, and they asked her, and, and, and just, you know, after that conversation, she tells them, uh, and where is she? She is in her own home. And who is there? Sayyidina Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa her husband, her prophet, is buried there. Her father is buried there. Sayyidina Umar, al-Anu, is buried there. Why isn't Aisha buried there? If she died in her own house. She died in her own house. Why is she not buried there? Why isn't she buried with her own husband? Whose decision was that? Hers. 
That was her decision. She said, bury me with my with my with my companions, with my Salahabi. Salahabi, my my co-wives. Bury me with bury, bury me with them. For who am I to be buried among these? Who am I to be buried among these? Can you imagine? Can you imagine? That was me. <laughs> and that was me. I mean, yeah, I understand the sentiment. Who am I to be buried? Yes, absolutely. Who am I to be buried with the Prophet Who am I? I am nobody, right? I know that sentiment. I know that sentiment very well, right? But then I'll start to make different, you know, I say, but you know, his light and, you know, the honor and it's a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Who am I to reject a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? I justify it a million and one ways. But Aisha who had the most right to that, and it's in her home, her, her own home. She can get buried wherever she wants. It's in, legally she has that right, right? Unless the Prophet himself, Sallallahu gave her some command like, "You cannot be buried here. You must be buried in Bakia." She had every right to be buried next to her husband. And what wife would not want to be buried next to her husband? What husband would not want to be buried next to next to his wife if it's a happy marriage based in love? But she says, no, bury me among my co -wives. Who am I to be buried next to me? So say what you will about Sayyidina Aisha. There are people in this ummah who have things to say about Sayyidina Aisha. Astaghfirullah. Astaghfirullah. It's only through her decision that when they visit the Prophet that, that they are not also visiting Aisha. It's only through her decision that, 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 that's, that that's the, the case. <coughs> Through her it's only through, from her humility that that's the case. And that is humility beyond belief. That is humility to the degree that I cannot follow. That I cannot follow. The closest person to the Prophet the most beloved person to the Prophet the person who had the most right to the Prophet removes herself and, and has, herself, has her soul buried, has her body buried, Meters away from him, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. After spending the most intimate moments with him, she says, Who am I? Who am I to be buried next to him? Aish. So he said, Ya Aish. Hashan Rabia. She says, Kuntu She said, Oh, it's nothing here, Rasulullah. He says, you're glistening and panting, you're, 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 you're perspiring and panting. She said, there's nothing. Else to do. So he said, you, either you will tell me, or the one who is well acquainted with all things will tell me. <laughs> <laughs> so, so she says, Ya Rasulullah, when you came in, I, I, you know, and then you left, I thought you went with one of the two. So she said, there's no way I'm going to keep this. So she says, I, I, I ransomed my father and my mother for you, and so I mentioned everything to him. And so, so he said, right? So you're that black figure, that black form that I saw in front of me, as the prophet's rushing back to, to her. He sees this black form in the distance, right? So you're this black form that I saw running in front of me. She said, so she said she confessed. And the Prophet said, Ya Aisha, he said, he said, I came in and I found you sleeping. And so I didn't want to disturb you. And Jibreel came to me and ordered me to go pray for the people of Baqiyah. And I didn't want to wake you such that you would feel loneliness in my absence. And then I rushed back to you. Huh? Then I rushed back to you so that the time would not be prolonged away from you. Huh? And so this was, you know, this was, uh, you know, he, uh, he, uh, he woke her up. You know? He woke her up. Like, where are you and where am I? Where is your head and where is mine? Where, you see, you, you, where are your thoughts taking you? Right? Where are your thoughts taking you? It's just your jealousy is overcoming. And, and look at where my thoughts are. I was, I was, you know, so, so he's showing her 
the concern, the consideration he had for Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Sayyidina Umar radiallahu anhu, um, he, on one occasion he comes and he says, and he's relating this hadith, he says, Inna kunna fin jahiliyati man aindu bin nisa'i amma. He said in the jahiliya, we didn't, we didn't give women any weight whatsoever. We didn't give them any weight. And so, we, in another narration he says, we used to control our women. And then, in Medina, we met men who were controlled by their women. And so our women began to learn from their women. And so on one occasion, I, I got into this tiff with my wife. And she began to raise her voice at me and talk back to me. And I said, how dare you talk back to me? This is not, this is not what, this, what's changed in me, right? How dare you talk back to me? And she said, she said someone better than you is, 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 receives this type of talk back, right? Someone better. And, and, she said, and he said, who? He said, Rasulullah received this from your daughter, Hafsa. <laughs> and he is livid. He can't believe what he just heard. But Hafsa, Hafsa raises her voice against Rasulullah. So he goes to Hafsa and he asks, he, he, he faces her about this. And Hafsa says, Yes, Wallahi, we do this with the Messenger of Allah. And he, he rebukes Hafsa and he says, Where will you be? If Allah is displeased with you, or if the Messenger Sallallahu is angry with you, how will you fare on the day if you've angered the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? And then he goes, he, he on his way to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he passes by Umm Salama, and, and he says, Umm Salama, is this right? Is this true? And Umm Salama says, Allah forgive you, Ibn Khattab. Are you also going to interfere in this matter as well? <laughs> and we're wearing niqab because of you. <laughs> you know, just just stay out, right? Stay out of it. And so he goes to the Prophet and he explains to her, Ya Rasulullah, we used to control our women in Mecca. Now we come to her, and he recites the whole thing, the whole diatribe. He goes to the whole diatribe once more. And so at the end, when he gets to the statement of Umm Salam, and he's quoting, he's quoting, my wife, and then this, and then Hafsa, and then that's what Hafsa told me. And then Umm Salama, I just saw Umm Salama, and she told me the same thing. And she said, why are you interfering, right? And once he said that, once he got to that point of the story, the Prophet Sallallahu started laughing. And that's where the hadith ends. <laughs> <laughs> just, just left him hanging, right? Totally left him hanging. In other words, what? In other words, deal with it. Right? <laughs> Just deal with it. You know? Man up. <laughs> so, um, so, uh, no. On one occasion, Hafsa, right? Or no, uh, Safiya. Something happens, Aisha is relating the story, and something happens with the Prophet I send it between the Prophet and Safiya. And so the Prophet Sallallahu is upset with him, and uh, he leaves her. Safiya comes to Aisha, comes to Aisha, and she says, and Aisha is relating the story. Safiya comes to Aisha, this is where I was laughing at before. Safiya comes to Aisha, and she says to Aisha, she says, work your charm, do whatever you can, just remove the feeling of vexation, the anger from the Prophet Sallallahu towards me, and I'll give you my next day. I'll give you my, ne my next visitation, uh, that's for you. And so Aisha says, nah, ana la, ana la. <laughs> she says, and so she goes and she gets a, a, a garment, right, that is, uh, that has been um, um, rubbed with saffron. And she puts water, she sprays water on it. So that the fragrance of the saffron can can uh, uh, be redolent in the garment, and she goes and she sits right next to the Prophet Sallallahu with this garment on, so that he can smell the, the saffron on that garment. And so the Prophet Sallallahu tells her, "Ilaki anni Aisha, 
He says, another day, Aisha. Today is not your day. Just stay away from me. <laughs> stay away from me, Aisha. Today is not your day. And so Aisha tells her, tells the Prophet and she says, Dalika Fadullah <laughs> she said, she said, that is the bounty of Allah. He gives it to whomsoever He wills. Right? He gives it to whomsoever He pleases. Right? So don't tell me it's my day or not. This is the bounty of Allah, and He assigns it to whomsoever He wills. <laughs> and she explains to him uh, what happened with Safiya, and that Safiya you know, enlisted her. And the Prophet begins to, he smiles, he laughs at the situation. Uh, any vexation goes from his heart. He's good with Sophia. Uh, Aisha worked her charm. <laughs> <clears throat> on one occasion, now how they would do that, the, the visitation with the Prophet Sallallahu on the night that it was any one of the, like, let's say it's Umm Salama's night tonight, all of the women would gather in the house of Umm Salama and they would just uh, have a um, conversation, they would socialize, they would all be socializing together. The kids are there, the, the wives are there, everyone's there. And then uh, when the Prophet comes, then they all leave and the Prophet stays with Umm Salama. So this is something, on a daily basis they would do this. Toward the, the end of the night, they would all gather together and they would just enjoy one another's company after all the work of the house uh, is done and, and the, the day has, uh, has, has, uh, has gone. They would enjoy one another's company. Uh, and so, uh, on one occasion, it was Aisha's night, and they were in Aisha's quarters. Uh, and so, um, on this occasion, then, the, uh, uh, it was late, it was late, it was rather dark. And so, <coughs> excuse me, who is this? Zainab. So, Zainab comes to the Prophet and extends her hand. And the Prophet takes her for Aisha, right? And then Aisha says, and she says it from a different place in the, in, in the room, she says, Inna ha Zainab, inna ha Zainab. That's Zainab, that's not me. That's Zainab. <laughs> and so the Prophet <laughs> removes his hand, right? He removes his hand. And so uh, uh, Zainab and Aisha then get into this, this quarrel, right? And their voices start to rise. And Abu Bakr the Anhu walks, of, uh, he's in the street. And he hears the voices of the wives and the of, of, of Zainab and Aisha. He hears his own daughter's voice coming outside into the street as they're arguing. And so the Prophet, so Abu Bakr al who says, he addresses the Prophet Ya Rasulullah, fi afwahihinna turab. He says, Ya Rasulullah, take dirt and, and thrust it into their mouths. Right? They were very protective of the Prophet Very protective. Especially Omar and Abu Bakr, very protective. One of the reasons for that is that they gave the Prophet ﷺ their daughters in marriage. So if their daughters are behaving like this, it's a reflection on how they raised them, right? It's a reflection on, so there's honor that's involved here, there's also their love for the Prophet ﷺ. They don't want that. They, like, none of the men do this with the Prophet ﷺ, except if you're a Bedouin from, you know, from, from, Way out, way out in the middle of nowhere, who just has no tarbiya whatsoever, right? no, no upbringing, no clue, and you come in and you get your tarbiya, right? But the companions of the Prophet did not treat him this way, and so they didn't have, they had very little tolerance for this. And so the Prophet leaves, he goes and he prays, and uh, Aisha thinks to herself, Abu Bakr. I mean for it now. My father's after, she knows what she's going to expect after the prayers. Right? That Abu Bakr is going to come and he's going to say this and he's going to do this and he's going to say it. And Abu Bakr he, he, he Abu Bakr he would come on more than one occasion, Abu Bakr was physical with, with Aisha. He, he he was physical with her, right? As her father, he was physical with her. <coughs> so Abu Bakr a lot of times we think of Abu Bakr the soft Abu Bakr and Omar the star the stern. Abu Bakr was soft, but he had the heart of Omar. And Omar was soft, but was hard, but he had the heart of Abu Bakr. Right? They, 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 were, they were both in balance. Right? 
They were both in total equilibrium. So uh, Abu Bakr comes and he begins to go at it with Aisha. How dare you? And how you know this is and so he and so the Prophet is standing between him and her. The Prophet rushes back because he knows that Abu Bakr is not going to this night. The Prophet rushes back. He leaves all the companions in the masjid. He rushes back. Abu Bakr Rana is there and he's going at, and the Prophet is there shielding Aisha from Abu Bakr. Shielding, and so he's protecting Aisha from Abu Bakr. And so Abu Bakr who leaves very, very upset, very angry. And so the Prophet Sallallahu turns to Aisha and he says to her, um, <laughs> right? he, said, he said, what do you think? You know, I, I, I saved you from the man. I saved you from the man. Right? He refers to Abu Bakr as the man. I saved you from that guy. Huh? <laughs> Which is that intimacy. So, you know, the father has intimacy with his daughter, but the husband is a totally different thing. The husband has, the husband has, has uh, the, the, the wife, the, the relationship between the husband and wife, that's, that's, that's otherworldly. And it's from the miracles of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's from the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he will bring perfect strangers, sometimes from the opposite ends of the earth. Like my wife is from Syria. I've never, well, I've never stepped foot in Syria before I married her. What would, what would a guy in New Jersey, born in New Jersey, and a woman who's never left Halab, right? What would, what would bring us together in the, in, in the, in the most in intimate way that human beings can be together? Except a miracle from Allah SWT that he joins perfect strangers and he puts between them mawadda and rahmah. Right? Mawadda and rahmah. Affection and compassion between those people that is not replicable with any other relationship possible. You can't have any other relationship that, and Allah SWT calls it ayah. Wumin ayati, right? And among his signs, among his miracles, is that he does this between the husband and the wife. Huh? So the Prophet goes to Aisha and he says, well, what do you think? You know, I, I saved you from the man, right? I saved you from the man. From the man, her father, her own father, who raised her, right? who spent all of his wealth on her, right? Raising her, providing for her every need. But now the Prophet is speaking about him as though, as though, you know, I protected you from the threat of the man, right? Huh? That intimacy that he created in Aisha uh, was just incredible. <clears throat> she would drink, right? She'd drink from the vessel. And then the Prophet would take the same vessel, right? And she's drinking from here. The Prophet is sitting here, right? And he would take from the same vessel and turn it like this and then drink right in front of him. Exactly from the place she drank. The little things sometimes. Sometimes it's just the little things huh? that, will, that will cause a person to forget, you know, great, great. Conflicts. Great conflicts. The next time you fight with your spouse, right, and it leads into an argument or something like that, God forbid, right, try one of these small, small gestures and see if that doesn't just melt the heart of, of, of your husband or melt the heart of your wife. Just totally, you know, you say, the fat melt. Whatever happened, that's in the past now. It's in the past. It's just a restoration of a. Of, of, uh, of, of the, it's, it's a revival of that emotion right? <coughs> that has to be renewed on a daily basis. <coughs> on one occasion, Aisha Ta'ala is with Hafsa, and they're right there traveling with the Prophet at night. And they used to draw lots. Whenever the Prophet ﷺ wanted to go, they would draw lots uh, to see who would go with the Prophet ﷺ on one of his trips. And uh, on this again, and, and a lot of times, Aisha and Hafsa, their lots were drawn more, more statistically, more than the other wives, if you had to compare. And so they were together on this trip, and the Prophet ﷺ, and Aisha goes to Hafsa, and they're in the hodek, right? They're in the hodek, covered. Right? So Aisha goes to Hafsa, and she says, Hafsa, what do you what do you think? I'll ride in your hodek and you ride in my hodek. Let's see what happens. 
basically, she, wherever they're going to sojourn, the Prophet Sallallahu is going to sojourn with one of his wives, right? So, uh, the, uh, the, uh, they did get to a place where they sojourned. The Prophet Sallallahu uh, is going to sojourn with one of his wives, and he uh, chooses for that night uh, Aisha. So he goes to the Hoda of Aisha, and he brings Hafsa out of that Hoda. <laughs> And Aisha, you know, so he's then, so he's going to stay with Hafsa. Yeah, yeah, whatever happened between the two happened, but he chose Hafsa. He intended Aisha, but he got Hafsa. And Aisha goes and she 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 finds this little pond, and she uh, she puts her feet in the pond, and she makes this dua to Allah. She says, "Oh Allah, send a scorpion or a snake or something just to just to bite me, right? Just to." <laughs> In spite of herself, right? Send some scorpion or or, or, or little garden snake to, to just bite me and teach me a lesson, right? I could that could have been me. <laughs> right? So many times she was she was she uh, reigned uh, victorious, but this was one of the defeats that she admits. On one occasion, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is with um, uh, is with. Um, the Prophet Sallallahu brings a prisoner of war to the house, and uh, and he tells the people in the house to to, to watch him, right? Uh, and so they they do, and Aisha, and it's in the house of Aisha, and they do, and the uh, and then he he frees himself somehow. He gets loose and he runs out, and Aisha didn't even notice because she was busy with something, right? And so the Prophet Sallallahu he comes and he says, where is he? And she says, oh, he's gone, right? He's gone, I can't believe it, he's gone. And so the Prophet Sallallahu says, Maliki, qata Allah right? He says, what is wrong with him? Yadaki, yadaki. He says, oh, what is wrong with him? May Allah cut your hands, right? Now, pedal back, back pedal a little bit. May Allah cut your hands. Uh, we have to understand that the Arabs had these phrases that were extremely harsh when taken literally. But no one in their right mind would ever take them literally. So they were usually mentioned in context of what is wrong with you, or in context with, uh, of um, uh, wake up, right? Wake up and smell the coffee, right? Uh, and they're very harsh. May his mother be bereft of him, right? Akra uh, akra, right? May, may, May he, may her hair be shaven, and may her may she be uh, hung by a, by the uh, her hamstrings. <laughs> you know, and then they would say this. Not, they would say this about animals, right? But they would. Uh, I mean, this was this came from from, from a phrase that they would uh, mention about animals, right? That they would. That they would shave the, the fur of the animal that they were slaughtering, and they would hang, hang it up by the hamstring. But they would redress one another with it as well. Like, may you have that same fate, where you're. So it's a very, very, you know, harsh thing to say. But no one in their right mind would take it literally. And I'll give you one example of this. It's a very dumb example. But if I was a, uh, a performer, and I go to some of my friends and I say, pray for me that I that I kill it on stage. Pray for me that I oh there's another one, I kill it on stage. And no one's gonna be like, no, please, please, I don't want you to arrest it. And I don't have money for bail. And then what am I gonna do about your kids? And then do you have a will that you are no one's gonna think that, right? So the the person says, I'll pray for you, you just break a leg. Right? <laughs> right? And so right about Getting on stage, and the, his, his BFF, his best friend forever, just told him to break a leg. Do you think that's going to affect his performance? Like, how could, how dare he say that to me? Like, oh my God! I hope. And, and then he's walking very cautiously on the steps, holding on to the railings. Bismillah. I hope I don't slip. Are there any? Don't tell you. Know, are there any bananas? Make sure that nobody's put a banana or a bar of soap on the ground. I don't want to break a leg, for God's sake. No one's going to take that seriously. But everyone understands 
that break a leg means good luck. The same way, all of these phrases mean wake up and smell the coffee, or they mean how, how could you, or they mean what is wrong with you, or they mean, you know what I'm saying? That's what they mean. That's what, and those are the contexts where they come from. Okay? Tari yada. May his hands clasp on dust. In other words, may he lose everything in, in, in an instant and have no property, no wealth. May all of it be gone from him. Right? This is not what they meant. But the Prophet said that even in these statements, even in these statements, he goes to the companions toward the end of his life and he presents himself to them and he says, whoever has anything against me, let him take it back from this day. Right? And what he meant for them, for that, uh, in that is anything that I have said, even for these statements that I have mentioned, that you have a right to retribution from me. You have a right to take back from me based on anything that I may have said. Even what's, what's fascinating about this is that the hadith of Mu'ad, when he tells Mu'ad, O oh, Mu'ad, kuffa alayka hada, right? Beware of this tongue, right? This, you know, this, this tongue says, this tongue could lead you into a hellfire, right? He says, Ya Rasulullah, are we, are we going to be taken to account for what we say also, not just what we do? And he says what? May your mother grieve over you, O Mu'ad. Are people cast into hellfire more than through the harvest of, what, of, of, of their tongues? Is there anything that will cast people more on their faces? than the harvest of their tongues. What's fascinating about that is, what did he just say? Sakinatska umma. With his tongue. He just said that with his tongue. May your mother be bereft of you. In other words, may you die. May you die, is what he said. Right? May you die. Is there anything that will drag people into the hellfire you know, more than what they say? So obviously, may you die is exempted from that, if the meaning of it is how they understood it, which is, get a clue, right? Get a clue, right? Are, are you kidding me? In other words, we say, are you kidding me? Well, no, I'm not kidding you. Uh, I didn't laugh, I didn't, you know. So these are, these are all phrases that are understood in their own context. So he says to Aisha, Malaki, Allah He says, what is wrong with you? May Allah cut your hands. And so um, he leaves her, and then he comes back. And when he comes back, he finds Aisha going like this. Right? And he says, what's wrong, Aisha? What's wrong? And she said, I'm, I'm just wondering which one of these hands is going to go first. <laughs> and so the Prophet said, I said, and smiled, and he laughs, and, you know, uh, Okay, yes. So the hadith that I shared about Sayyidina Abu Bakr where he goes to Sayyidina Aisha <coughs> and the Prophet <coughs> defends, the Prophet defends Aisha from her father, uh, that hadith has a completion. And the completion uh, of it is that uh, the, the next time that Abu Bakr uh, comes back to the house of the Prophet enters the, the quarters of Aisha, uh, he finds the Prophet Sallallahu and Aisha uh, smiling, engaging one another, um, you know, as if nothing happened. And so he says to uh, them both, he says, "Adkhunani, adkhilani, fi sinmikuma kama adkhaltumani fi harbikuma." Adkhilani. Right? Is that correct? In other words, he says, enter me into your truce as you entered me into your war. <laughs> and so, group hug, group hug. Um, and I also wanted to mention uh, something that I mentioned before. Jazakallah uh, khairan. I have one of my teachers among us here who is watching my every word. Allah bless him um, and uh, allow us all to, to learn so much from him.
he really should be teaching us, uh, and it's from his humility and my lack thereof that I'm even ac accepted the invitation to speak. Uh, but uh, he has mentioned to me that one of the things I said about Abdullah bin Salam, the Jew, the, this rabbi who became Muslim, that was actually before Banu Quraiba, right? That was before Banu Quraiba. He didn't, he didn't become Muslim after the Prophet ﷺ married Safiya, as I had alluded to. And um, to be honest, I didn't mean that. Uh, I didn't mean to put those two events as though it was cause and effect. But I um, was. Uh, what I didn't say clearly was that that is the kind of marriage that would allow someone like A. Abdullah ibn Salam to enter into Islam easily. And I didn't mention it like that. I should have said it like that. Uh, but Abdullah ibn Abdul Salam, Abdul Salam, uh, Abdul Abdul Salam was also was Muslim already before that point. Right? So I just wanted to make that clear. Is everyone clear on that? No. So. Um, to mention the children of the Prophet ﷺ, and they were seven. Uh, the first of them was in Qasim, right, which is very interesting. My wife just uh, about a week or so ago, she said, SubhanAllah, what is this name in Qasim? What is this name that the Prophet ﷺ chose for his first, um, his firstborn in Qasim? The one who, the one who apportions out, right? The one who apportions out. Uh, what did he have in mind? Have you read anything on that, Sadie? What did he have in mind when he, like some of the Lata'if of that, the Fawa'if of that? It's on Al Qasim. <clears throat> one can only wonder. The one who apportions out what is good. Right? The one who gives everyone their due of what is good. <clears throat> so he was born to the, to, to the Prophet in Khadija, and there is a difference of opinion about how long he. He tarried, uh, some saying that he uh, lived for about 17 months. Uh, and he was the first of the children of the Prophet ﷺ to be born, and the first of the children of the Prophet ﷺ to die. And then uh, Abdullah, right, Abdullah. Well, actually, we have an order that Ibn Qayyim al Jawziyah gives us. He gives us a certain order, a, 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 uh, an order to, to their birth. And Allah SWT knows best. Uh, but Al Qasim, and then you have Zainab, and then you have Ruqayya, and then Umm Kulthum, and then Fatima, and then Abdullah, and then Ibrahim. And Allah SWT knows best, but Ibn Qayyim uh, gives us that uh, in Zad al Ma'an, gives us that order. Uh, so the way that, uh, that we have it here, the way that this author has put it, uh, is Al Qasim and then Abdullah ibn Nabi Sallallahu and Abdullah was known as Al Tayyib Al Tahir, Al Tayyib Al Tahir, um, and uh, these were nicknames for the uh, for, for him. Al Tayyib, the pure one, Al Tahir, the pure one, right? Uh, and so these are synonymous, right? The, the, the pure of the pure. Um, and then Zainab, uh, the daughter of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Zainab. <coughs> Her husband was Abin As ibn al Rabia, uh, and he was the um, he was the nephew of Khadija. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, and Zainab, let's see. So yes, okay. So the Prophet uh, So he's giving us a little bit of background. The Prophet She married a man named Abin As ibn al Rabia. Sorry, I told you that several times. Um, and uh, when Allah subhanahu wa taala uh, gave the Prophet Sallallahu the, the, the called him to the Office of Prophecy. Um, Khadija and all of her daughters accepted the Prophet Sallallahu obviously. Um, and uh, Abu al-As remained on his shirk. Right? Abu al-As remained on his shirk. And the Prophet Sallallahu had previously wed Ruqayya uh, to Utba ibn Abi Lahab and Umm Kuthum he married to Utayba ibn Abi Lahab. So the two daughters, Umm Kulthum and Ruqayya, Uthman did not marry them as virgins, right? But he uh, married them to these two men, Utba ibn Abi Lahab and Utayba ibn Abi Lahab. 
And both of them, Ibn Abi Lahab, right? These are the two children of Abu Lahab. So Abu Lahab was the father-in-law of Ruqayya and Umm Kulthum, right? And so all, both of them divorced uh, uh, Ruqayya and Umm Kulthum. They both divorced them. Uh, but Abu Al-As was also pressured to divorce Zainab and the Prophet Sallallahu and he refused to do so. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam honored him for that. He, he always had a special place in his heart for Abu Al-As because he refused to divorce um, his, uh, his daughter. Now this was before the law comes down forbidding a woman from being in a marriage with a kafir. Right? That comes later. Right? But in this time, um, the Prophet Sallallahu daughters are returned to him, which means that he has now the extra burden of taking care of them and uh, providing for them. And so uh, this, um, this uh, plays itself out. And so um, Abu Al-As, they went to Abu Al-As and tried to convince him to, to uh, divorce her, and he said that he, and, and he, uh, he refused to do so. Uh, and he loved her very much. Um, then it just so happened that he um, <clears throat> was among the, uh, the prisoners of war of Badr. He was among the prisoners of war of Badr. And now it's not just, you know, I'm, it's, it's, you know yes, you refused to marry the, not my daughter, but you partook in this battle against us. And so what happened was he uh, was taken as a prisoner and he sought the shelter. He sought shelter in the house of whom? Zain. Right? And this is after the Prophet ﷺ, now they're divorced. Right? Now they're divorced. The Prophet ﷺ, they, they're no longer married. And the Prophet ﷺ, on one occasion, he is, you know, after this battle, he's praying Fajr and he hears the voice of Zainab, his daughter, saying that, I have given protection, I've granted protection to Abu Al-As. And after the, the, the prayer, the Prophet ﷺ turns to the Sahaba and he says, I, you heard it when I heard it. I didn't know of this before you all heard this. Right? And this is at Fajr, right? At Fajr. So he's, he's seeking her protection. And the Prophet ﷺ goes to her and he says, and he basically tells her that she has, you know, reminding her that she is not halal to him. Right? But then he uh, he also um, he also grants him uh, amnesty. <coughs> Excuse me. And then um, and then uh, a short while later, he professes his Islam, and the Prophet ﷺ remarries them. They marry. So I'm sorry, I'm a bit, I'm a bit off. I didn't get this far in my, in my reading. I was supposed to read this uh, this morning, but I didn't get this far, just to jog my memory. Um, the fourth child was Ruqayya bint al-Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, And, uh, and Ruqayya, the daughter of the, the, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, she was married to Sayyidina Uthman. And after um, the, uh, uh, in one of the battles, in, in, the, in the battle of Badr, Sayyidina Uthman did not attend that battle because he was taking care of Ruqayya. Right? Uh, Ruqayya had fallen ill, and so the Prophet had told him to stay behind to nurse Ruqayya to back, back to health. And so when he had come back from Badr, um, she, uh, he found that she had already been buried, and obviously he, he was not there to, 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 to bury his own daughter. So the body of his own. This is it's, it's fascinating. Allah SWT gives the Prophet SallAllahu Alaihi Wasallam seven children. Six of those children he buries with his own hands. And the seventh of them, Fatima, he tells, that, he tells her that she's to die. And so the Prophet SallAllahu Alaihi Wasallam having all of these children and none of them outlasting him, none of them surpassing him. Uh, he buries them all young. Fatima died uh, in, her, in her 20s. And so they, each one of them, he had to endure the pain of losing those children. Uh, um Kulthum um, is now wed to Uthman, and she, uh, what, what is known about when, when she died, Uthman was not with her that night, the night that she passed away. 
uh, he was with uh, his concubine. And the Prophet ﷺ was hurt by this. And when uh, it came time to bury her, the Prophet ﷺ said, uh, who among you uh, has not, um, whoever among you has not uh, um, uh, had conjugal relations last night can go into her grave to, uh, to, to can bury, can go descend with, into the grave to, to finish off the burial process. And, uh, and Uthman had to stay up. He couldn't go down. You know? And so the family members of, of uh, the, the other family members then uh, uh, took her body and buried her, uh, and Uthman could not. And so this was a way of reprimanding Uthman for not being with him with his uh, daughter the night before. Fatima, the, wife, the, the daughter of the Prophet obviously Fatima, we know very much about her. There's, there's very little that I can add, except that it is known in our tradition that Fatima, and you may not have heard this, but Fatima is considered to be the female embodiment of the Prophet Muhammad Even on the Prophet's deathbed, when, I, when she comes close to the Prophet Aisha remarks as she's telling the story that of, of the whispering twice into his ear. She remarks saying, and I never saw anyone who resembled the Prophet more in the way that he walked than Fatima. And he, he kissed her head whenever she would enter a room. Uh, uh, Fatima was, was the Prophet uh, she, she was Ummu Abiha, she was called, the mother of her father. Um, so she, in every way, uh, sought to replace her own her own mother Khadija, and that consolation that Khadija would give to the Prophet he found in Fatima, and so she reminded him all the time. She constantly reminded him of Khadija, and that treatment, that care, that that love, that 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 she she would uh, pour out to the Prophet She would weep while taking the thorns out from his from his blessed feet. She would weep. In taking the, the clothing uh, that that had been uh, that had been uh, smeared and that had been that the abuse that he had had to face, she would weep in taking all of that off of him. Uh, Fatima, the day the Prophet passed, she says, um, "Ya Abata." She's with Sayyidina Anas and she says, Ya Anas, kayfa tabat anfuskum and tahtat turaba ala Rasulillah. How did you find it in yourselves to cast dirt upon the Messenger of Allah? How could you possibly have done that? She says, Ya Abata, ajaba rabban da'a. Ya Abata, jannatun fiddawsi ma'wa. Ya Abata, ina jibreela ana'a. And she wept bitterly. She said, Oh my father, uh, after having taken the dirt from where he is buried, rubbed her eyes with that dirt, she said, Oh, my dear father, who has answered the call of his Lord, Oh, my dear father, the heaven of paradise is his refuge. Oh, my dear father, to Jibreel I send my condolences. He said, Subdat alayya. She said, Subdat alayya. Masayib. She said, Mada ala man shanna turbata ahmadi. She says, what do you say about someone who smells the dirt of Ahmed? That he is not able ever again to smell any fragrant odor, any fragrant scent. She said, tribulation has been poured out on top of me that if it would pour it out onto all of the days, it would change them all into nights. This was her grief over the passing of her dear father. Salam. What do you say about a woman who, once she is told that you will soon die, you will soon die, that she leaves him, she leaves the person telling her this, she leaves him smiling, rejoicing, happy, laughing, and Aisha is just, she's mesmerized. Well, what did the Pope Sahas tell him? Oh, he told me I was going to die. He told me I was going to die. In your 20s. And Fatima knows her time is coming. He knows her time is coming. 
She's seen, she's seen all of her siblings die. She's seen all of her siblings, well, well perhaps not the, the, the first two because uh, they died very, very young before she was born. But she knows that all of her siblings have died. And what do you say of Imam Ali who could scarcely find, who could scarcely collect himself after the passing of his grand, of his, of his uncle, of, of his cousin, Kersi collect himself after the passing of the Prophet Muhammad sallam, while mourning at the same time the anticipated death of his wife, the mother of Al Hassan al Hussein. For him, his grief was 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 ten times that of anyone in all of Medina, because he lost the Prophet sallam, as they lost him, and he knew that and and and, and, and Fatima was near. Fatima was there. She didn't just tell Aisha and not tell her husband. Fatima was there. So Fatima lives all of those days, those bitter, bitter, sweet days, watching her children play and Hassan and Hussein, wondering what is to come of them, wondering what is to come of her husband, wondering what is to come of, uh, of her household wondering what the future will bring. And her only consolation is that she will be reunited with the Prophet and her, her father, who told her that she would reign supreme over all of the women of Jannah. All of the women of paradise, she would reign supreme above them. She would have a rank above all of them. And al Hassan and Hussein would have rank over all of the youth. But he said, there would be one woman who has rank over you, and that is Maryam bint Imran, the, 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 the Umm Isa, that Maryam, the daughter of Imran, the mother of Jesus, she would have superiority over you and over all the rest of the women in, in paradise. The household of the Prophet was met with tragedy after tragedy after tragedy after tragedy. And in all of that, there is khayyir all of that there is goodness for you and me. In all of that there is goodness. For the Prophet had to go through all of those experiences so that he could say, Man asabat, man fi Whoever is afflicted with any calamity whatsoever it may be, let him remember his calamity vis a vis losing me. Let him compare that calamity to losing me. For that is the greatest of all calamities. And she bore, she bore children for Imam Ali Ali Her sons were Al Hasan. Basically, when the Prophet came to Imam Ali Ali he said, "What did you name him?" On the seventh day, he said, "What are you going to name him?" And he said, "Hab, war." And he said, no, no, he's al Hassan." And so when Hussein was born, the Prophet on the seventh day, they brought him to, to, to the Prophet for the tahniq and the naming. And he said, what are you going to name him? And he said, ha, war. And so he said, no, 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 he's just a little version of Hassan. He's a Hussein. He's just a tiny little Hassan. You see Hassan running around, two, three years old? You see Hassan? This is just a little Hassan. So he named him Hussein. And on the third, the, the, the day that the third son was born to Imam Ali Ali Salam and Fatima Ali Salam, they brought him on the third day to the, on the seventh day to the Prophet Sallallahu and he asked, what are you going to name him? And he said, Har. He said, no. He said, war. Right? He said, no, 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 no. This is Muhsin or Muhsin. And the reason why we don't hear about it is usually is Hassan and Hussein. Hassan and Hussein, we don't hear about Hassan, is that he died very young. He died as, a, as an infant, died very shortly after that. Ibrahim, the son of the Prophet, and Ibrahim was born to um, Nadia in Kutbiya. Did I cover them all? I covered them all, right? So Ibrahim, and he was born to uh, Maria and Fitbiya. And Ibrahim, there's a place where in the Baqiyah, 
and Allah knows best where it is believed that Ibrahim's grave is there. And it's, uh, it's marked by a small, a very, very small enclosure of rocks, right, around uh, on, a raised, uh, on a raised plateau. And it's believed that Sayyidina Ibrahim is buried there. Uh, you can see just as an infant, you have just a small thing, right? They, they made that for Sayyidina Ibrahim And Allah knows best. Uh, the Prophet Sallallahu would go, and I think I mentioned this, he would go in his visits to Maria, he would go and, and smell Ibrahim, and kiss him. And he would do this with other children as well. He called children the flowers of heaven. Right? That, that fragrance that Allah Subhanahu Wa infuses into infants, right? the beautiful fragrance. You know, no matter where that child is from, right? anywhere in the world you pick up a child from between from, from right after they come out of the womb all the way until a good year goes by, right? Uh, and they have this beautiful fragrance, this pleasant, pleasant fragrance. But the Prophet uh, uh, called them the flowers of heaven, that these children are the flowers of heaven. Look at what, look at how he honors the creations. Look at how look at how he allows us to perceive and how he connects us to the unseen and to the and to the, 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 the what is otherworldly, what is divine. And he takes our hearts into supernal, sort of sublime meanings. Now, <clears throat> and on the day that Ibrahim died, the Prophet ﷺ wept. And they asked the Prophet ﷺ, uh, Ya Rasulullah, so you, you, you were weeping. And he says, he says uh, his famous dua, he says to Ibn Auf, he says, Inna al-ayna tatma' wa al-qalba yahzan wa la nakulu illa ma yurdi rabba. That the eye uh, sheds tears and the heart feels the grief, but we don't say anything except that which pleases our Lord. And we are uh, ever sorrowful over your parting from us, O Ibrahim. Prophet he loved Ibrahim, he loved him. And he would, he would go to visit just to be with his son. And she, she lived, the Prophet ﷺ kept Maria away specifically for uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best, but the, the, the understanding is that uh, she was um, exceptionally beautiful and uh, he did not, uh, he was sensitive to the feelings of uh, his wives and with his wives, uh, and, and so Maria he kept at a distance. Uh, but he would visit from time to time and uh, Obviously, she became Muslim along with her sister Sirin, uh, and uh, and she gave him uh, Ibrahim. So she became Umm Walad as a result. I wish we knew more about Maria. One of the reasons we don't know so much is because she uh, we don't even know if she spoke Arabic. <laughs> she was Coptic. Who knows what they were talking? About? Who knows what that language was? I don't know how you how do you speak in hieroglyphics? Uh, they weren't speaking Arabic. The text, come on now, that's anachronistic. All right. <laughs> so one of the things, um, one of the most important hadith when discussing the Prophet as father is what we receive from Sayyidina Anas radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Sayyidina Anas radiallahu anhu, um, and this is the first hadith that opens up the section of the character of the Prophet in the book uh, Al-Wafa bi Ahwal al-Mustafa by um, Abu Faraj uh, uh, ibn Jawzi, right? He says, uh, he, he lists this as the very first hadith. And it had such an effect on me when I read it, <coughs> when I was reading through that book, that I decided to name my own son Anas, uh, based on this hadith. Uh, Sayyidina Anas, and there's a lot of different narrations of this hadith. I'll try to combine them. He says that, he says, uh, and he tells the story of his first day in Medina, uh, how he remembers it. He was 10 years old. He said, when the Prophet first came, my mother, uh, who's Umm Sulaim, he took her, and Umm Sulaim, by the way, she is the woman who, remember that little boy? Oh, no, we didn't talk about this. Abu uh, Amir, we didn't talk about this. Okay, that's going to take us into a different, I'm sorry. That'll be for a different time. But Anas Radhan, who said that, um, the day that the Prophet came, my mother gifted me to him to be in his service. And فَخَدَمْتُ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهِ عَشَرَةَ عَوَامِ So 
So I served the Messenger of Allah for 10, 10 years. Whether he was in Medina or traveling. And he never once said to me, Ah! That's a translation of Uf. Ah! He never once said to me, he never once expressed the slightest utterance of frustration ever with me. And he never struck me. And he never insulted me. And he never once said to me, and this is this is the, the real, I think this is the, 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 the climax of the hadith, that he never once said to me regarding something that I had done, why did you do that? Nor for something that I had neglected to do, why didn't you do that? And I'll come back to that. Or, and never once did his wife chide me for anything, except that he would say, leave him, leave him. For this was decreed for him to do, this was written and decreed for him to do. And in, a, in, a, in another narration, if something is decreed, it must necessarily come to pass. So leave him be. So he would rush to his defense. Right? And Anas al-Rahim was making mistakes. But going back to this point about, I never, he never once asked me, why did you do this or why didn't you do that? This, for me, was one of the greatest proofs for his being a prophet. This whole hadith right, is one of the greatest proofs that never once expressing frustration at a child never once expressing frustration at a child and Anas is going to make his mistakes the proof for that is in the narration he said his wives never chided me except that he would defend me so he's making mistakes or, or else why are they rebuking him right? he's feeling Bowls, he's breaking stuff, he's not doing what he's supposed to do, he's neglecting to do what he was asked to do, he's doing what he wasn't asked to do. And, he's, and everywhere the Prophet goes, there's Anas. He can't get rid of him. He's a thief, right? He's a young, a young, you know, a young child, right? He's 10. He's not a thief, he's a sabi now. But the whole thing about this is that children will latch on to you. And as they latch on to you, they are going to go through a hundred different moods a day, right? And sometimes they have their good days, sometimes they have their bad days. Sometimes they have their angelic days, and sometimes, you know, where did you come from, you little demon? Like, like did you come from, a, like, whose are you? To whom do you belong? Right? Seriously. And through all of that, the Prophet never, never expresses the slightest utterance of frustration to say nothing. Never once. That for me was a miracle beyond beyond words, right? And something a little biographical about me. I, I named my Anas, my, my son Anas, for this hadith. I said, you know, every time I call upon his name, it will remind me of this hadith and why I named him Anas, right? And 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 inshallah, you know, that would be a constant reminder for me to treat him the way the Prophet ﷺ treated Anas. To build him up, to defend him where where he needs to be built up and not and not struck down, right? Where because you can you can you know you can it's very you know with children children can recover from almost any traumatic event. There are children born in Syria who all they know is war, and they can make it through like like super superheroes, straight up. Iman intact, everything exactly as pure and innocent, and that, that's all retained for them, that's all preserved for them. They have resilience beyond belief, and, and these are there are children walking around without any honors. 
amputated, totally, totally, with their arms gone because of a bomb that just fell on them. And, they, and it's as though they had both their arms. It's as though they had both their arms. And they look around at their siblings who have two arms and two legs, and they don't even ask, why me? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given them contentment in their innocence. They have contentment with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Children. And that's the fitrah. That's the state of the fitrah. Is whatever Allah does with me, I belong to him. That's what they have. And so they can make it through trauma. But you break the psyche of a child, and they'll never be able to recover from that. You break somebody's psyche, and you've destroyed them for life. It takes therapy and psychiatry and psychology. All, all, it takes everything. They've got to throw that in drugs and all kinds of you know, medicines, prescribed medicines, and some unprescribed medicines. Right? It takes all kinds of stuff to get a person to come back from a broken psyche. And so the Prophet ﷺ is treating Anas and Anas, he cannot shake Anas. Anas is there. Every time he walks a corner, Anas is there. He wants water for wudu, Anas is bringing the water. He's done with wudu, Anas takes the water over. He's ready to eat, Anas brings the food. He's done. And then Anas is sitting there eating with him. Right? He cannot shake this child off. And Anas is with him in all of the houses. We have this idea that, oh, where did Anas live? Oh, he must have lived in Aisha's house. <laughs> Why? Because the Prophet was always in Aisha's house? No, he wasn't. The Prophet was not always in any house. And Anas was always there, always with him in the, in the, in the houses. Anas was a servant. He would travel and he would take Anas with him. That's why we have so much from Anas. We have so much from Anas. You talk about the Shema'id, look at how many times Anas' name comes up in the Shema'id. And, and he gives us so much. He's the last companion to live in Basra. He's the last companion to live in Basra. And it is related that Abu Hanifa met Anas. He, saw, he, he actually saw him. Right? He didn't take Hadith from him, but he saw him. He met him. That's how long Ennis lived. SubhanAllah. <laughs> so, you know, being raised with that delicacy, being raised with the Prophet in that way, you come into manhood. Right? The Prophet is not going, he is building Ennis from the ground up. And he is not going to throw a guilty complex on him or anything like that, guilty. Like, Ennis knows when he makes a mistake. What's the point in chiding him after he has already felt the guilt of his mistake? What's the point? And there's so much to learn from that. That after a child or a spouse or a friend has wronged you or, or has wronged themselves and is aware that they have done so, <coughs> there's no role that you play in that anymore except to uplift them. Not to, not to drag their noses in it. Not to drag their noses in it like we do with dogs. When we train them to behave properly. That's what, that's what we do with dogs. And we don't take that same methodology and apply it to our wives or our husbands. To make them feel guilty about what they've done. You should have done that, and you should have done that, and you should have done this, and you should have. Where is good character now? Where is good character now? If you should have, could have, would have. Are you not transacting with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in everything that befalls you? Is not Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the one who decrees everything that befalls you? And this doesn't mean that you never ask a child why or why not. Right? It doesn't mean you never ask your child why did you do this or why didn't you do that. You can ask that question, but what is behind your, your asking? If it's to teach the child to go through a certain, you know, a certain thought process in order to reevaluate the decision that he or she has made, then now that's teaching. You're actually teaching that child to, to think through their actions. You know, why did you hit your sister? Now they're, they're, you're 
having that child engage their emotions, right? And there's a pedagogy in that. There's a there's a beautiful that, that that's that's an okay question to ask. Why, right? That's an okay that, for for that. It's okay to ask why, but this is a different type of why that Anas Ravalma was talking about. It's a different type of why. This is the why that make you feel when you're already feeling this small. It makes you feel, it dwarfs you even more. And that's the type of why that comes right out of the nafs. That's the type of why that is gut, that is driven by the nafs. That you have wronged me, or you have not done what I asked you to do, and you know you should have done this, and why didn't you do that? And just to make that person feel that much worse about themselves. And the Prophet <coughs> lifted people's spirits, and he didn't. And he entered. He took contentment and thrust it into their hearts. That's what he. Inward happiness, he thrust that into the hearts of the people closest to him and the people and, and, and the companions in general. Just by the way he would smile or look at them. So that that why that question why in a marriage should be the heaviest question on your tongue. That should be the heaviest question on your tongue. Why did you do this? Why didn't you do that? That should be the heaviest question on your tongue. Just from a psychological perspective, it puts the person on the defensive. And they feel that they now have to defend their decision to you. And now they're looking upon you like you're a policeman or like you're 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 you know, you're like like I can't please you. There's no uh, I can't do anything to please you. I can't do anything right. You know, I'm constantly gonna mess up. Right? Why can't I get this right? Why can't I make him happy? Why can't I make her happy? And that sets in, and then it accumulates over time. It accumulates over time, and ultimately, the person feels that whatever they do, they cannot, they cannot please their significant others. Whatever they do, and they don't feel accepted. They don't feel loved. They don't feel appreciated. They don't feel like, well, all, look at all of the other things that I'm doing. Right? Why harp on this and make me feel miserable about it? I already feel miserable about it. So that question, why, should be the last question to escape it. That, that should be the last. We should, we should actually, when we feel that question, why, coming up, th this, is, this is the solution to it. Everybody ready? Everybody ready? Stick out your tongues. Now bite down. Now put your tongues back in your mouth. Why should you didn't need to stick out your tongues? You could have just bitten, bit down on your tongue. Just bite down on your tongue. Every time that question why surfaces to the top of your mind, right? That, you know, and you know where it's coming from. You know that it's coming from the nafs. If you know that it's coming from the nafs, bite down on your tongue. Don't ask. Don't ask. And in doing so, you are following the sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu In doing so, you are bringing prophetic light into your relationship by doing that. Don't ask why. And just bask in the decree of your Lord, who just wrote that mistake to happen. Who just wrote that scenario to fold out the way to unfold the way it did in order to try you. In order to try you. So instead of making that person feel miserable, right? Whatever happened was a test for you through that. And ultimately, we are engaging our Lord. Ultimately, we are engaging our Lord. Our Lord is behind every test. Our Lord is behind every blessing. Our Lord. Imam Ali Alayhi said, There is nothing that befalls me. There is nothing that befalls me except that I see Allah before it, in it, and after it. In other words, I see Allah before it. Meaning, whatever caused that thing to happen, I see Allah as that cause. Then the thing happens itself, I see Allah as the effect. And then after it, I see Allah as the wisdom of the cause and the effect. If that is how we are perceiving reality, then the question why would be the furthest from our minds. But if you have to ask the, if you ask the question why, then the first thing to, to realize is that you are veiled from the wisdom of Allah. 
Why means that I cannot see through the veil between me and the decree. I can't see through it. It's too thick. So I have to ask why. And you have to give me the answer. Why is a crime in this relationship? Why is a crime in this relationship? And ultimately, it will not get you the results that you are seeking. Ultimately, it's not going to rectify it. Ultimately, it's going to make it worse. It's going to make it worse. Because you have now put, that, put your beloved, who is sent there in order to refine your character, on the defensive. And they now have to deal with their um, with their deficiencies and their faults coupled with your displeasure and your discontent and your anger and your expectations that are unfulfilled and, and their misery and their suffering and their it's just, there's, there's no goodness out of it. There's no good that comes out. And there's no spiritual maturity right, that can be acquired from a person who cannot bring himself to accept the decree of Allah as it is. Now, if there is recurring behavior, if there is something that actually needs to be addressed, if there is a, a if there is a uh, if there is something that really annoys you, then don't ask the question why. Just have a heartfelt conversation and say. I would really appreciate it if instead of doing doing something like this, that you consider doing it like that. That would be really that would that would be much better. Right? I would really appreciate it if you could do that. Would you mind doing that for me? And I'm ready to do whatever you would like. You know, have I been you know, pushing your buttons lately? Is there anything? You know, just talk through these issues. Talk through these issues. But to ask the question why and to chide and reprimand and all of this, this is not going to bring us anywhere. In So that's all I just want to do. I'm sorry about that. <clears throat> uh, so we said that we would uh, go to a five with the option of Q&A or the option of continuing. So, right? so what do we want to do? Questions? You guys want to ask questions? There's a question. Um, yes, I had a question. A friend of mine outside we were talking about this. Um, she just wanted to know. Um, oh, she well, she wanted to know. Um, so when you mentioned Takasa um, and uh, Omar Rabiyan's daughter, we, there's always like um, hadith that the father was advising her, or you know, he's worried that she's going to get divorced. So she wanted to know. Mothers, like, did they have a role to play? Do they have any information about them, or is it just only the father? Uh, no, I, of course they have a role to play in this, but we we relate what we have received, uh, so, and so we just haven't received. <coughs> or, or let me say, I haven't come across. It may be there, and I and, and there's hundreds of thousands of hadith, but I haven't come across uh, many scenarios where the mothers also are. Uh, are mentioned like the father. Right? So, of course, it happens, but and it may be there, it may be reported. I just haven't read enough. And that, that's my fault. I have another question. So, um, the children of the Prophet Sassan, the wives from their previous marriages, did they live in his home? Like, did they take care of the women taking care of them? Or, like, what happened to them? The previous the ones that he adopted. Wives that they were married before they had children. Yeah, so they happened? remained. They remained uh, in his. Uh, oh, that's a good question. That's a good question. Say, uh, did the children go back to their families, to their, or did they remain in the Prophet's family? Yeah. That's a good question. I I assumed that they remained, but but I that was my own assumption. It may be true, and it may be the case that they actually went back to some of their relatives uh, on the mother's side. Although. Um, I haven't read anything this way or that way. Um, what do we know, or what can you tell us about how did his other family uh, say the Hadith? 
Uh, Hamza? Oh, sorry, I think it's Harith. Harith? Isn't it? Yeah. Uh, from Sayyidina Halima? Yeah. His, uh, his uh, wet nurse? Exactly. Yeah. Uh, so Hamza also was uh, okay. was his brother through suffering. Um, uh, Harith? What can we say about Harith? As an adult, yeah. Like, not from the time, like when his heart was cleansed and that whole story. I'm, I'm thinking they must have continued the relationship later on. And Harith, uh, no, no, I, 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 don't know. I don't know. There's a lot to be said about him. I don't have. I, I, I haven't prepared anything about him. Say, did you have any? We have, we have a, in our midst a person who's extremely knowledgeable about the Sira and about these questions. Say, the Muhammad, you can, you can ask Sayyidina Muhammad afterwards, and uh, he may have something to share with you. But uh, he's, a, uh, he, he's a bit. Uh, he, he would prefer to, to answer questions in private as opposed to public. It's up to you. Do, should we keep going with questions or share a few more anecdotes or what would you like to do? Anecdotes. So everyone says say Q and A. Everyone. Hands. Q &A. Everyone has to vote. You can't just plead the fifth. So Q and A. Show of hands. Q and A. Hi, hi, hi up in the air. Don't be shy. Q and A. Everyone has to raise their hands for one of the two. So I'm assuming that everyone is going to raise their hands for for continuing with anecdotes if I if, if, if these hands come down. Okay? Anecdotes? Okay. <laughs> and that doesn't mean we won't do a Q and A. So after five, if you want to come up to me, we can have a private Q and A. Channel. So it is related that the Prophet uh, Sayyidi uh, Anas relates the Prophet with his grandson and Hassan, he noticed that the Prophet would be, be very playful with him. And he would grab him, he would hold him in his arm and, and uh, stick out his tongue to him. And Hassan would try to grab for his tongue, and the Prophet would not allow him to, to grab onto his tongue. And he would stick out his tongue again and he would grab for is when Hassan was very, very young. Uh, al Hassan and Al Hussein used to ride on the back of the Prophet and uh, and uh, he would say to them, uh, "What? Oh, what, what? What a strong horse you, you both have! Oh, what, oh, what a strong camel you have!" Mashallah. So he would walk on all fours with both of his uh, his grandsons on his uh, back. On one occasion, he's giving a khutbah, and Al Hassan. <coughs> Uh, is running uh, uh, toward him, and he trips and stumbles and falls. And the Prophet ﷺ smiles in the middle of his khutbah, where he's telling people, "Ittaqullah, Ittaqullah," right? Have fear of Allah, have fear of Allah. And then he, he breaks into a smile, and he said, "Inna min awladikum fitna." He says that among your children and your uh, spouses is a great tribulation. And so Hassan comes, and Prophet ﷺ kneels down, picking him up. And he continues his khutbah after that. Um, he used to carry an Hassan uh, on his uh, his shoulder. Um, um, he would ask. Uh, so this is all. This is mostly about uh, Hassan. Here, Abu Hurairah uh, relates that um, <coughs> excuse me, that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam once. Um, Uh, came into the house of Fatima, and he said to her, "Athamma luka, athamma luka, right? Is luka here? Is luka here? That was his nickname for luka, for for Hassan luka." Uh, I should have looked this up. I don't know what luka means. What is luka? Luka. It's made in the I want to know what that means. Luka. But it's a funny, it's a funny sounding name, nonetheless. Uh, this is a good place, I think, to talk about. Um, well, no, because that's not at the home. So uh, we said that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi with the children who are in his house, uh, Sayyidina Anas who once mentions that on one occasion uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi asked me to do something, uh, and I 
said to him, No, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> right? And I and I had every intention on doing, but you know how children go through a quote unquote rebellious phase that lasts about ten years. <laughs> right? Uh, this was uh, uh, Satan uh, Anas's rebellious moment that he had with the Prophet He said, "I'm not going to do it." And um, and in my in my heart, I had every intention of doing it. Right? And so I left out and, and uh, to play with some of the children. Uh, and then I was going to do it, but I was going to do it later. And the Prophet said, uh, after a while, he came, he came out and he grabbed Anas from behind, uh, grabbed him. By the neck, right? Grabbed him by the neck, turned his head toward him and looked at him, right? So he turns his head toward him and he says, Unais, it's a little Ennis, did you do what I asked you to do? And he said, Inni dahibun ya Rasulullah, I was on my way, I was on my way to <laughs> And so the Prophet said in a smile, um, <laughs> And this shows, you know, that as a parent, you have to pick your battles with. It's not my way or the highway 24-7 all the time. There are certain times that you have to, so you, you have to be stern, and certain times you just got to let things slide, let it go. Right? And the children will test you from the very beginning. Right? They'll try to test those limits from the very beginning. So the sternness may be required early on so that they get those boundaries drawn very clearly around them early, but those boundaries need to blur up a little bit as the child gets older. 777 is the prescription. Seven years, uh, you are, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, he says, uh, right? Right? So you, you train them for seven years, and then you uh, you uh, teach them, uh, you, 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 you um, uh, Discipline them for seven, and then acculturate them for seven, and then befriend them for seven. No, and then, um, uh, 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 yes, be befriend them for seven, and then let them go after that. <clears throat> no. The Prophet was in the constant, uh, he was constantly visiting uh, his daughters. As they were married, he would go and spend time with his daughters. This was something that he was uh, in the uh, habit of doing. So long. Where did he find the time to do any of what he did? But he did it as a as a constant routine. Uh, he would uh, marry them. Uh, he would uh, visit them. Uh, and uh, anything that would cause harm to any of his daughters, uh, he felt that. Uh, one time, uh, Fatima got word that Sayyidina Ali he didn't get word, but it came up that Sayyidina Ali was considering marrying uh, uh, someone uh, in addition to Fatima. And Fatima uh, came to the Prophet uh, expressing uh, her uh, feelings about that. And so the Prophet went to Sayyidina Ali and told him, uh, anything that harms Fatima harms me. Did someone find what Luka meant? I have a friend who recently named uh, one of the names of a child. Um, Luka? Her, her, yeah, her trans, one of his names. Her translation is bringer of light. Uh, Let me see. So it's, it's Lam, Ka, Ain, yes. Hamza? Or but the no, name of Buddha. I just looked it up. It's meaning of it. Mm. Pertaining to a child. Yeah, but that's true. Yeah. But it's an interesting meaning, like the one, uh, it's like a, a, a child that like butts heads with the mom or something like that to get suckling from her, <laughs> like when they put their head on the mom's chest. But her meaning is from uh, Farsi, so I don't know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I didn't see it there, but they didn't have it in there. I'm not really too sure. I have to look in the, uh, you, don't, you don't want to look to a dictionary for these things. You want to look to the commentaries of the Hadith. And I didn't look at the commentary of this hadith here. The commentaries of the hadith, they would have, they would have these, uh, 
these words spelled out. So I think with that then, uh, inshallah, perhaps we should bring, it, bring this to a close. Uh, let's have a couple more questions uh, before we, uh, we do our final summary. So I had some written questions. Written questions. Uh, do we have any more that are in raised hands here? The guys didn't ask any questions. Were you guys awake this whole time? Or? No questions. I, I get it all. I have it all. No. Did you go over Abdullah? Abdullah, yes, he, he, he died during the Abdullah. Abdullah al Tahir, he was called. No, Abdullah al Tahir was one of his nicknames. And, uh, and, and he died during the race. They all died. My question is the part about like asking your, your partner or your child like the why. Uh, can you speak a little bit more about that? Because I'm trying to understand. Like I mean, I spoke for 20 minutes. Yeah. I, I I get that, but basically, like, is it more because you try to understand why that person did that, or you just trying to make that person feel little? Like, no, you, it, the, the, you you know when it's coming from the nerves. If it's coming from the nerves, bite down on the tongue. If it's actually coming from uh, wanting to to know the reason behind it. Like, what, what were you thinking when you did that? Because you, know, you want to sort of appreciate the wisdom of why they, let's say, you know, something happens and, and, and the explanation would be helpful. So that's a different type of why, because you need an explanation for it in order to understand what just happened, right? Uh, you know, but uh, but if, if, it's, if, the ex if, if, if it's just a, a mistake that happened and your why is in order to pretty much make that pe person feel worse, or make yourself feel better, or um, uh, you know, because you, by 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 dumping on somebody else, you feel like you got it off your chest, and now you know you can breathe a little. But but you just dumped it on it, right? So that kind of a why you never want to. Hmm? A rhetorical why? Yeah. Is that the why you ask me talking about? Well, I mean, uh, even rhetorical why could could be with that intent. I'm talking about when that is the intent, whether it's rhetorical or you're demanding an answer, right? That's the type of why that is destructive. That's the type of why that that will that will just ruin somebody's day. Just you know, so, you know what I'm saying. So does anyone understand? understand or? So there's a book about that, and it's called uh, "Taking the War Out of Our Words." Mm. And the main thing they, they I heard about it on NPR. They talk about the question "Why," that it's the number one way to interrogate someone is to just ask why. Yeah. And that people, no matter how innocent they are, they automatically get defensive. And they feel like they're being attacked. So it's not a marriage book, but it does talk a lot about marriage, and so that might be helpful. Yeah, but what is the name of the book again? Um, the name of the book is, it's called Taking the War Out of Our Words by Shannon Ellison. Taking the War Out of Our Words yeah. by Shannon Ellison. Taking the war out of our words by Shannon Ellison. Thank you very much. I'm Dirima. Yes. Um, I think you gave us some practical advice, like biting the tongue, biting our tongues when we feel like um, that if we're, our nuts is talking or reacting. Do you have any other practical advice for us? I mean, you know, whenever I come to these classes, I feel very inspired, and I'm like, I'm going to do better when I go home. And then when you go home, life happens, and you just like, it just automatically you get back into the, your old habits. So how do you break those habits? How do you fuck the nuts? Or do you have any other advice? I mean, uh, we, we have to do a whole, you know, there's a whole, uh, a whole lot to be said there. You know, it's, uh, um, basically, the, in, a, in a nutshell, Imam al Ghazali prescribes ilm and amal for any improvement of any or refinement of any condition. Right? 
in Panama. So there is a theoretical component and then there's a practical component to rid oneself of a vice or to overcome a certain tendency or habit to break one or to break out of it. The knowledge that is required, I think we've gone through a few sessions of that to where we've acquired enough knowledge of, uh, on it to inspire us. Right? And then now the practical steps, that's what, uh, which, is, which is what's required. How do I then bring this knowledge into my daily practice? And know that all the scenarios that are going to present themselves to you, they are now going to present themselves to you as vessels into which you can put this knowledge. Right? Every conversation you have with your, with your significant the significant people in your life now can be seen as an opportunity to put this knowledge into practice. You see what I'm saying? So it, it changes our perception of what befalls us. Such that, you know, the, the test now, it becomes clear. The, the whole thing is that there's, there's, inshallah, there's a veil that has been lifted. And with the lifting of that veil, we can perceive and interpret more correctly, more accurately, the events as they are transpiring. And to try to see Allah SWT in those events. And then it infuses those engagements and those interactions with much more meaning than the mundane routine life. I go back to my routine life. Nothing's routine about life. If you're able to see Allah before, in, and after a thing. Nothing's routine about that. So now, I think with the rehearsal of this information, this, this, this content, this knowledge that we've, we've traversed together, to repeat it to ourselves, to take something from this, uh, uh, you know, even if it's one thing, take one thing from this and say, I'm going to work on this. This is going to be my thing. And then one thing that, that a person can do is every day commit, commit to, uh, and this could be part of our litany, every single day, to commit oneself to a certain pledge, right? to take a certain pledge with yourself. And uh, I actually wrote this pledge out. On, uh, you know, um, I'd like to just share it with you, inshallah, so that uh, so that we can benefit from one another in this. <clears throat> so every day, and you can do your own ten prayers, right? But these are my ten prayers that I would. Um, that I think if there's any benefit in Shalom, then you can remember some of this. So, uh, dear Lord, um, and I wrote them in, in English because I tend to think in English, and English is my mother tongue. Uh, even though it wasn't the first language I learned, it became dominant. So, whatever your language is, make it authentic to yourselves. Uh, dear Lord, bless and sanctify your messenger and his family. So, begin our prayers with that and to end our prayers with that. You begin and you end your prayers with that, then everything that is in between the beginning and the end is likely to be accepted, inshallah. Dear Lord, reflect your names and attributes upon the mirror of my spirit. Dear Lord, delight me in the laughter of my parents. Dear Lord, make me a meadow of heaven for my wife. Dear Lord, allow my children to see in me whom you want them to be. Dear Lord, help me to be stronger than the world is terrible. Dear Lord, alleviate through me the suffering of one of your servants today. Dear Lord, bless my time with what is pleasing to you and nudge me to procrastinate tomorrow. Dear Lord, destroy any hope Lucifer has renewed this day against me. Dear Lord, allow me to live what you have taught me and guide me to flee from you unto you. Dear Lord, clear my vision such that I may only behold you in all that was, is, and shall be. Dear Lord, greet the Prophet Muhammad on my behalf that he may mention me to you. Okay. So these are litanies that a person can engage in at the beginning of every day. Right? to sort of pledge oneself to these. You know, that, that, uh, you know in, in, in various religious traditions, they wake up in the morning and they, they recite certain pledges in the morning. Like in Buddhism, there's a, there's a litany that they go through that they, that they pledge themselves 
to alleviate suffering in the world. They pledge themselves to, to not be violent against any person. They pledge, so it's like a daily pledge that you make with yourself. So draw out your, write, write your own ten prayers that are the dearest things to you and begin every day with those. Uh, that way, throughout the day, whenever the test or the tribulation comes, you'll be able to anticipate it because you've asked Allah SWT for help and, you'll, and, and all of the tests now will come in the context of what you asked for. See what I'm saying? So these are, this is another practical thing you can do. Another practical thing you can do, especially when the question why comes up and you, you, you find that you're angry, instead of asking why, go and make wudu. The Prophet ﷺ said, it's a practical thing, he said, if anger is to overcome any one of you, then make wudu. He says, because he says, إِنَّمَا الْغَضَبُ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ وَإِنَّمَا الشَّيْطَانُ خُلِقَ مِنْ نَارِ وَإِنَّمَا النَّارُ تُدْفَعُ بِالْنَارِ He says that uh, you know, uh, anger is from shaitan. And shaitan was created from fire. And fire can only be put out with water. فَإِذَا غَضِبَ أَحَدُكُمْ فَلْيَتَوَبُ So if any one of you is overtaken by anger, let him make wudu. Put out that anger with wudu. We might have heard that several times, actually. We might, may have heard that. But how many of us have actually done that when overcome with, with anger? So the, the, the point of it is now to act on those things that you already know. Wallahi well, alaikum, I swear by Allah, I swear by Allah. And I, and I feel very confident, confident in this. That if you didn't learn a single thing more about your religion, you have enough to enter into Jannah if we just act on what we already know. You don't need another conference, you don't need another lecture, you don't need another book, you don't need another, you know, what we, what we need is a little bit of, of that, that push, that nudge, to start acting on what we know. I think one of the feelings of, of, of separation is that we've, we know too much. We know too much. And we don't have an output mechanism for it. We haven't taken advantage of you know, infusing this knowledge into some practical action that's going to bring about some beauty in our lives and the lives of the people around us. So I think that the time is, is, is nigh for us to roll up our sleeves and to start acting on what we know. And if we do that for the next, if you've gotten this far, 20, 30, 40, 50 years, by acquiring all this knowledge, then the next 20, 40, 50 years, if you acquire no more knowledge, and just focus on acting on what you've acquired, you're good. And that's not to say that no one's been acting on the knowledge that you've had, right? That's not to say that. The Simahum fi right? The beauty is the beauty of their actions is in their faces. And, you, know, you, you all reflect that. Right? But I think a lot a, a lot of the uh, a lot of what makes us feel that my Iman is not strengthening, my Iman is not growing, my Iman is not deepening, comes from the fact that we know too much and we don't act on much of what we know. And once we're able to do that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings us into a totally different spiritual space. Inside, inward, we begin to experience the delight of our faith in different ways. But the, the soul needs the, 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 the the ruh, right, it thrives in the deeds of virtue. That's where it thrives. In the deeds of virtue. Pardon me, not for me. Allahumma salli wa sallam wa barakha wa sallam 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 wa Subhanakallah, <laughs> كثيرا 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 ولا تحلمنا يا رب العالمين معية رسولك صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم في هذه الدنيا وفي الأخرى في السكنات وفي الحركات وفي الأفعال وفي الأقوال وفي الأحوال يا رحمة الرحمين وسلم تسليما كثيرا